live on Collaborate. So today we're going to talk uh, about intellectual property. I will talk some more about the assessment. We're going to do that a little bit later on um, in the in the class, uh, which will be on the recording as well. All right, so we're just going to kick this off now. Last week we talked about um, real property involving land and personal property, things that can be owned, both tangible and intangible things. Now, strictly speaking, what we're doing today is actually a subset of intangibles in the, in the legal sense. And I know that that uh, in the accounting sense, sometimes I think you use the word intangible differently. I think intangible has a very specific meaning, meaning goodwill and such like, whereas rights uh, that you can obtain uh, from intellectual property, which include patents, designs, trademarks, uh, and copyright, they can actually be valued in some way. Again, I'm not an actuary. Uh, I'm just um, suggesting such things are capable of being valued by people much, much, much cleverer than I. Uh, but for the purposes of law, we're doing and studying law, we're, um, we just refer to these as a type of in, intangible property. Okay, and some things to note about intangible property or intellectual property uh, is that it's, and this is a really important thing, is that having an idea, this is not sufficient to get protection sure. under the law. So with each of these first four uh, things in the list that which is on the screen there the the real key thing the really important thing is that all of the protection you get under the law is actually only to do with you taking your idea and enshrining it in some way bringing it into the world in some way um, I don't know if any of you guys have friends who have been promising to write a book and they've had all these great ideas. And um, I found as a professional software developer that you would have a lot of people coming to you and saying, yeah, 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 nice. Jeez, I was, thanks, Gonzalo. Um, I found a lot of people come to me, oh, I've got this great idea for software. And <laughs> um, having a great idea, uh, only a real small fraction of the battle in terms of software, most of the, uh, the the work that goes with it is the um, is actually very technical in nature. So the the idea, while that is essential and that is important, really this aspect of the law is a, is about protecting doers, not thinkers. Um, I I just I can't tell you how many times I've had people come to you and they they would tell me their great software idea. Ah. Oh, I'm going to make this game, and the graph. You just have to make the graphics awesome. And I, it just makes me want to just shake my head, my hands like this. It's a. The devil is in the details because taking the idea and enshrining it in that case into code is essentially all of the work. So all I find when people come with me to, to me with ideas was some thing, some random idea, sometimes half-baked that they've got, and they just wanted me to do all the work for them. And um, you know, I find that when I'm doing most of the work for something, that you also appreciate that you end up with most of the protection. And that's how the law works. When you do the work and you enshrine that in something that appears in the world, it's usually you as the creator who gets the, the, um, the protections under the law. Now, I've included the fifth item here, confidential information. This doesn't really work the same as these other types of intellectual property, which are protected both uh, weakly under common law, but largely by a series of statutes, federal statutes, um, because uh, intellectual property, copyrights, designs, patents, is all, it's actually the domain of the federal government uh, under a particular head, which I can't remember the number off the top of my head, in the uh, section 51 of the Australian Constitution. Um, so all of this stuff is federal law. If you have difficulties, dramas, you need to go to court, it's the federal court system that you have to go to in order to obtain a remedy. Okay, so just, just make note that even though I've listed that confidential information is a type of intellectual property, it's kind of not really the same as the other ones. But now I'll explain it in a couple of hours' time when we get towards the end of this lecture. So um, 
so really that's kind of, that's kind of the overview we've had that, but I, I just, I, I'm just going to reiterate the point because it's a really, really powerful one. It's not the idea itself that gets protected. It's how the works. It's how the expression of that idea in the world um, to create something which is a benefit to humankind. That's the thing that the law wants to protect. Um, and really, that's, that's why when you look at how each of these um, particular areas of intellectual property have been developed. Uh, first of all, think that there there's very much a, a commerce aspect to this, and not just is there a commerce in terms of the wheels of commerce um, grinding like we have for contract law. It's also largely about incentives, and so that when we look at, at these protections the law give the creators of um, of works and the people who take their ideas and put them into the world, we want to protect them in some way, but that's largely to encourage innovation. It's to encourage the creation of things. Because if you think about it, ideas that are, enshrined, are brought into the world as works in this day and age of digital stuff, once an idea is written out in the, the in, in written form, for example, of source code, be it source code, which is protected by copyright, uh, designs, which are represent 2D representations of things, um, which can be easily represented either as a bitmap or a vector diagram, patents, which are a set of instructions for something which is either inventive or innovative, and trademarks, which are, are a particular se set or series of signs which associate a particular brand uh, with that particular sign. Um, all of these things, we want people to go into the world and create. We want the world to do that because once they've created it, it's in the world and everybody can see it. And with some of the, particularly the more scientific things, which fall under the copyright and the patent sphere, um, once it's in the world, in theory, it it's available for everyone. And so that when we think about copyright as being a sort of a terrible thing that stops people from doing stuff and patents being a terrible thing that creates a monopoly right in regards to inventions, it also in theory gives people the incentive to do those acts of creation. Um, and so I'll, um, I'll talk about copyright from a variety of things, but I, again, coming from a, a, a long, long, long standing software background, uh, source code. Uh, do you guys know what I mean by source code? So the, the code which you have for, um, for software programs, which once you've typed the code up, you then compile it and it turns it into an executable file. And in the olden days, you used to put it on a disk, a uh, floppy disk or a compact disk or a, a DVD. Uh, sometimes you let people download it. Um, these days, uh, source code really comes in two sorts of flavors. You have um, stuff which is client side, which anybody can access, JavaScript and HTML. Anyone can access that because it comes through the browser. And then you have stuff which is on a server. Um, this stuff, not quite so interested in terms of the copyright and that because people are publishing anywhere. Whereas this stuff is um, is much more precious because it's usually easier to control. Okay. So, uh, and with patents, the main area I'm going to talk about is going to be to do with pharmaceuticals, drugs, drug companies coming up with the new fancy new drugs for stuff particularly relevant. In this this very unusual year that we sit in. Okay, let's transition that. And let's transition that. All right, so we're going to start with the first one of these: copyright. Um, copyright, strictly speaking. Oh, just make note: copyright is written as one word. Trademark is written as two words. That's just how it works. Um, okay. And oh, I've got a. I actually have some videos for this particular one because it's really quite sad. Um, I'm going to start with a high-level point, which is uh, copyright is governed by a, a federal statute, the um, Copyright Act, which gets amended from time to time. Um, and the copyright is an exclusive right for a person to make copies of works. That's what it is. Hence the copy and the rights. So it's R I G H T. It's a right, like you have a personal right or a proprietary right to do something. You have a right to copy the thing. Um, in the olden days, that would be books. Um, I said more recently, it's things like um, uh, musical scores and um, computer software. No, there are actually there are actually a couple of quite obscure 
um, intellectual property statutes that I don't cover for this, involving particularly involving uh, electronic circuit boards and plant breeds rights. So those two statutes, they're, they're kind of similar to, to copyright and to design, uh, but they have their own very niche, very, very specialised thing. I don't really go into those in any detail, um, but just be aware of their existence. You certainly won't be assessed on it. Okay, so that's the key thing to note. And look, a bit of history to this. Um, copyright's actually been around for a long time. Uh, the, the common law has protected uh, works that people do, do and create for quite a long time, but it used to be quite weak. Um, I think 200 years ago, it was the equivalent of about, I think 14 years after something was created, you had an exclusive right to do it. And it wasn't very well um, uh, enforced because we have the benefit in this day and age to have a lot of government agencies that go about doing the enforcement process. Whereas back in the in the year old days, 200 years ago, you had, really had to rely on um, yourself being able to fund uh, the exploiting this. And so interestingly, I've got a work here which actually involves the work of a guy called Charles Dickens. Um, and kind of hilariously, Dickens used to, um, used to publish, um, rather, he used to have hearings for each chapter of a new book that we have. So he would have a public gathering and charge people money to go and listen as he reads a chapter from his book. Okay, why would you think he would do something like that? This is going back uh, 200 years, 150 to 200 years. Yeah, Abhishek. Uh, maybe he's trying to create an exclusive club where he's making himself an exclusive property that he is reading the book himself. And if you want to hear, if you want to be a part of that event, you have to pay for it. He's, he's marketing himself as a super uh, product. Exactly. Get a little bit of cash in the pocket. Um, however, he was quite a famous, became quite a famous author quite early on. And what he found, though, <laughs> kind of hilariously, is that because he was, he was British, he was English. So he would produce the book and be able to have it protected in England. What would happen, though, the moment that he published an entire book, it would go straight off to the colonies, we'd go to North America, and where the copyright protections were, were very lax. And so that the moment he, he published the entire book, the whole lot, bang, it's all gone to the colonies, and it's all going um, and he's not going to make any money from that. So he found that by releasing them in, in smaller doses, that he was able to control that as part of, the, uh, part of that process as well. Um, which uh, I thought was interesting because, as you appreciate, the Americans for the last you know, sort of 50 to 100 years have been the country most concerned about intellectual property and really going and forcing other countries for the you know, putting the thing on them to make them go and make their own internal um, copyright protection systems much more robust. That's largely to protect American intellectual property interests. Um, and as we see, there's one particular powerful American uh, entity which drives, has driven all of this over the last 50 years. It's very, very funny. Um, does anybody know who I might be referring to? Yeah, nice one, Gotano. That's it. Mickey Mouse is an extremely problematic uh, character in the world of copyright. And Mickey Mouse and its creator, a guy called Walt Disney, have um, have had a lot of influence uh, over how copyright has worked, particularly how um, the American system of copyright has um, has various legislation, various lobbyist groups to their Congress to make them increase the length that uh, things that copyright protections lasted for, uh, and it looks like. It's finally running out. So in the 70s, the 1970s, the, um, the Steamboat Willie was the name of a uh, movie. It was the first movie with Mickey Mouse in it. And the way it worked with corporate copyright is that it lasted, I believe, at the time for 60 years. So that was due to run out in 60, maybe 50-something, maybe 55. It was due to run out in the early 80s. And so in the mid-70s, Walt Disney um, petitioned the US Congress to increase that. So they, and then they increased it to the 90s. And then they, <laughs> then in 1998, they petitioned Bill Clinton to push it out again. Then in this century, they, they petitioned other 
uh, they got the US Congress and the US government to um, uh, push all of the relevant sort of US allies and European Union and uh, certainly countries like Australia to change their copyright. Um, and it's all, it's all been driven to protect Mickey Mouse. But it looks like in the year 2023, it is actually going to run out. Um, so Mickey Mouse is going to go into what's called the public domain. Once something is in the public domain, you can no longer prevent others from using the, those works. Okay, so for example, the works of Mozart or, you, you know, the, uh, uh, the you know, ancient philosophers, um, you know, Gautama, Konze, uh, Pythagoras, um, certainly you know, Plato and the, um, the Neoplatonists and early uh, Christian uh, Christian thinkers, all of the um, Islamic early Islamic texts, these are all out of copyright, long out of copyright. They're freely able to be copied. Um, work, most works from the 1800s um, are able to be copied. So Dickens being an example here. Um, okay, and so that that's, we call that the public domain. Put it in the little chat. Public, public domain. You need to know that too. Okay, so that's what happens when works have the copyright has expired, which is why we can go um, and get, um, I don't know if you guys have seen the um, Puffin or Penguin, Penguin books. They have these particular, these very, very cheap looking books. So something like the works of um, Jane Austen, for example, or any of the musical scores of, of Mozart or of Beethoven. They're all long, long, long out of copyright. You can go and buy them and they really don't cost anything. You can download from the internet wherever you like. But important thing to note that before I made the comment about copyright arising from works, not from ideas. Okay, so that if somebody goes and creates a work, right, that work is subject to copyright. And the copyright lasts for a certain length of time. Uh, and again, I'll explain those rules in terms of the in terms of that length. Um, but you do have to note that there's some some problems can come from that. So for example, if you go to a musical concert, all right, go to a concert and you do a bootlegging. You know what a bootlegging is? You ever heard of the phrase boot? Oop, boot. That phrase mean anything? Something. You, you, you copy it. Yeah. But check. Bootlegging would ideally mean uh, into some illicit uh, business. Uh, well, ideally, when we say bootleggers, there are people who provide you with uh, alcohol in uh, places like this band or provide substances which you can, which can, I mean, uh, that's, that's what I know about bootlegging. Really? Bootleggers I, uh, are basically. I do know the, um, the expression that you're using there. In that sort of environment, people selling um, stuff out of literally out of the boots of cars. But, uh, but here I'm specifically meaning to people who go to concerts or use to go to concerts with um, video or sorry, audio recording devices and then get a recording of a particular concert and then go and distribute it. Remember that copyright is all about protecting um, the distribution of stuff. Now, one of the interesting things about copyright, though, is that if you're doing a recording, um, and this is, takes a little bit to get your head around here, you actually own that particular recording. It's actually yours. It's actually yours. So you are the creator. Essentially, it becomes a, what we call a derived work. To send them a call. Oh, absolutely, Hina. Yeah, if you sit there with your mobile phone, you actually own that particular uh, recording that is illegal. Um, it's it's often unlawful, but the reason for that there's, there's twofold. One is that sometimes the um, for many concerts, as part of you uh, your ticket, the contractual obligation you have is to is that when you go into these places, you won't record. All right, a lot of places have that contractual obligation. Now. If there's no contractual obligation, so you're not in breach of contract, strictly speaking, you can go through and do that, all right? But we know that it's about, copyright is all about the distribution of things. And the trouble is with copyright is that while you own this particular recording, 
some of the material inside that recording, in other words, the actual movie that you're watching, is actually owned by the movie company. So this takes a little bit to get your head around. And the, I, I like to use this example, um, and I, it really only comes from, uh, for me as a Kiwi, it's a very specific New Zealand example. G'day, Alan. Um, has anybody here in, particularly those that uh, moved into Australia, heard of a radio station called Triple J? Uh, yeah, thanks, Gonzalo. <laughs> token, token Aussie. All right, you as the token Aussie can explain. Oh, Marie's there as well. Righto. So, um, what, um, uh, Marie, if, if you've got your headset or anything, do you want to explain what Triple J is? Uh, a radio station, alternative Australian music. Yeah, that's it. And they would be usually kind of cutting edge stuff. So it was a, aimed kind of at young people, but it was often the cutting edge stuff. Now, I'm a Kiwi, so we didn't have Triple J in New Zealand. But what we did get at the end of each year, um, sort of as part of a generic Christmas presents, were, was the Triple J compilation. And again, I'm old, so these were CDs. It was a two CD pack. And it was a collection made by the Triple J people of the best 40 songs they reckon of that particular year. Okay? Now, the all of the people at Triple J, all right, they, they have come together to make this compilation. They own that compilation, the collection of songs, but they don't own the songs themselves. So just have a think about that for a second. When you've got a compilation of 40 songs, yep, yeah, getting there, Alan. The, they, the Triple J guys own the compilation. It's called the Triple J Hot, oh, it was the Hot 100. So yeah, I've, I think I've done that wrong. So it was 100 songs, 50 songs, Hot 50. I can't even remember what it was called. 50, Hot 50, whatever it was. Either way. It was their collection, hottest, yeah, hottest 100, something like that. It was a, and so they would have this collection where they've chosen these songs, all right? But they don't own the individual songs themselves. I think of it as akin to creating a playlist. I mean, it was creating a playlist, but you don't own the songs contained within that playlist. So, but the work that can be predicted is the list itself. So distributing the list of those songs would be protected under copyright, but the individual songs themselves on the CDs were owned by the recording companies, Sony and whoever. And the only reason that the Triple J guys could sell these CDs, they paid a license fee. They paid royalties to each of the uh, license holders for the songs in the compilation that they sold it, which is why you'd, you know, they'd sell the thing for sort of... $40, something similar, and they'd pay most of that, you know, $35 of that would be paying royalties to the various companies. Does that make sense? Because that's really, I think, as an illustration, it really goes where um, it, it shows how where copyright fits in the, uh, in the context of works within other works. Because this key thing is, going back to this, this core theme, it's only about stuff that's been created. It's not about the underlying ideas behind stuff. Um, and so Donahue and Allied newspapers uh, involved, basically involved that, uh, which was a, a guy, a jockey, who was invited to, uh, I don't know, actually maybe he wasn't invited. Actually, I think somebody might have written a story about his life. Okay, and they go to places where he'd been, he had a notorious life. And... He then tried to sue the newspaper company and say, hey, this is my life. And the court said, well, it might be your life, but you didn't create the works. Uh, the fact that you didn't ask them to create it, it's actually not relevant here. Certainly there's no tort of invasion of privacy. Um, as it happens, you're a public figure anyway. And so that, that idea that when you create uh, works, it's not about the underlying substance behind it. It's about the creation itself. When the Triple J guys create their compilation, it doesn't change or influence any of the underlying um, ideas or works or 
in that particular case, any of the copyrights held by any of the songs? Yeah, tell her. So technically, if I decide to write, uh, I don't know, your biography, you know, I just woke up and said, you know what, I'm going to write Simon's biography. Yep. I have the right to do so. Absolutely. And you can't stop me even if I'm writing a false biography. False or whatever biography is different. What would be what area of law would we be using to uh, to seek compensation if it if it's false or create cast me in a bad light? Uh, that would be uh, what do you call it? We studied it in uh, yeah uh, defaming. What is it? The defamation. Defamation. Yeah. Defamation. Yeah. That that's the area of law that I'd bring the action under. You own the copyright to the thing that you create. So it's kind of curious that um, I don't have the right to copy and distribute all of the, or for whatever reason, all of the nasty things that you might have said about me. Um, you've created that thing. I don't actually have a right to go and distribute that and, and collect money from that. Um, but you have the right to sue me exactly. if the content is not uh, of your liking or it's not true. If such a, that's right. If it's if it well, it has to be harmful in some way, has to it has to be, remember those three three limbs of defamation. Yeah, yeah. No. And one of the remedies I can seek is actually an injunction. Ask the court to stop you from distributing this thing. And you'll see when we do the remedies for copyright, you can actually get injunctions under the Copyright Act as well. Okay, but it's just the key thing to note there is that um, it's the idea of works, not the ideas themselves. The fact that it's your life story doesn't actually change it. Like I said, there's still some remedy, but it's not in copyright law. Third one said it is a tribute by if is it a tribute to anyone by his hang on is the, uh under copyright no no I'm not, not sure I might have to rephrase that or um, we'll turn your mic on and ask it. I'm not sure I um not sure I'm following that particular question, but um but I will mention the um the uh, the next case here, which is the um the idea that the copyright, once works are created, the copyright is an intangible right. And it actually exists independent from the created works itself. So the example here, funnily enough, actually involves uh, Dickens. That is Charles Dickens they're referring to. But it's um, it's not him, or sorry, it's long after he died. Uh, and it was his manuscripts. Because they were a bunch of physical manuscripts. And Dickens when he died, had said, I want the rights for those to go to one relative, to uh, I think a cousin or a nephew or a niece. Um, but his sister was to receive the physical manuscripts. And so there was something of a problem there. Who has the rights to actually go and exploit the manuscripts of, of Charles Dickens? And it turns out, who do you think it would be? The person with the physical manuscripts or the person with the um, uh, da, 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 oh, I'll do it as a poll. Who has the right? Who has the best? Who who holds the copyright? I'll type this up. Holds the copyright. Okay. Oh, hang on. Let's wait just a second. Um, I think I said, I think it was a nephew. Uh, hello. Uh, my question is, uh, like, uh, you create a music, and after 20 or 50 years later, I copy your music, and when I get caught, I said to them, like, I tribute you, I, I, I'm going to tribute your song. So in that sense, uh, is that under Copyright Act? or? Yeah, if uh, you... Uh, be, uh, it, yeah, uh, like I said, yeah. uh, when I get caught, and I said I go, I'm gonna tribute to you. So in that um, case, usually one of the things about copyright is that, particularly with broadcasting, is that often it's quite easy to catch people because they're often broadcasting or they're trying to make money from things. One of the things you find about copyright, just from a practical rule of evidence, is that it's not often that people bring actions where a person's created something, others have distributed it, but they're not making money. Usually these things come back to money. 
And so that it's usually that point in time where you can see where some of these derived uh, work from yours that you can seek some sort of action under the uh, Copyright Act. Is it copyright lasts for a length of time, which we'll get to in a, a few slides uh, in there, so that if it's within that time period, you can bring an action. Uh, okay, I have another one more question, which is uh, suppose uh, you uh, you have this lecture on your YouTube channel. So again, I create an, another channel and I copy your video and, uh, and share by my name. So is that under Copyright Act? Yes, it's under, it's under copyright law, which is which is governed by the Act in a bunch of cases as well. Yeah, so if you did that, um, it's making so a couple of things. Strictly speaking, if you uh, take your mobile phone and you just went to the screen and just recorded it, all right. Strictly speaking, you own the copyright to that recording, but the underlying material, so material that's contained within that is still held uh, by me for, as, the, as the person originally creating it, um, originally creating those works. So that's why, the, again, it seems a little bit tricky, but the, generally the right that you end up having is, is basically the weaker right. I can still go and seek an injunction. I can still go seek what we call an account of profits. So if you go and take that recording and you sell it and you make money from it, I can ask the court to take that money and give it to me. That's essentially what we call an account of profits, and that's under the um, under the statute, under the Copyright Act. Okay, uh, and I'll note here with the poll, where most of you guys have realized that that one there, the, the physical manuscript and the rights, the copyrights that flowed from that are two different and distinct things. And so you're right, in the Dickens case, the sister who had the physical manuscript, she lost. And so it was the person who Mr. Dickens said in the will is to receive all of the rights and royalties in regards to that particular, um, to his particular works. Okay, um, now I get to play a video because this is an example. I'm going to give a musical example and I'm hoping this is going to work. Now, I do have to point out that I end up getting banned in, uh, from YouTube. So you won't be able to find this lecture from last year in some countries. So if you happen to log in and you happen to be watching all of the last year's videos, you won't get it. And that's because I left the microphone on and I was playing music that was copyrighted and it was in the background. And YouTube actually detects that and it, it flags you. So if you go have a little look, it'll say that it's had some copyright uh, dramas. So hilariously, my lecture on copyright infringed copyright. What can I say? So what I'm going to do, I'm going to play it, but I won't be able to play it. Uh, I can play it in the Collaborate session, but I can't play it on YouTube. So if anybody here is listening to the YouTube, um, uh, are you listening to the YouTube thing? We're talking about the EMI songs and Larrikin music. And for those, and I think Guatano, I'm pretty sure has, has seen this before, because I actually think that I showed it to him when he did business law many, many, many years ago. Um, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to do a, um, uh, I'm going to have to pause the audio on the YouTube. So if you guys on YouTube, I'm just going to go silent for just a little bit. Sorry about this. All right. I can't hear us now. I'm then going to share. I did it with Neil. Sorry. Oh, yeah. I was there too. I think for you, Neil, I might have been with Mel. I do remember you. All right. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to do share application. We're on three. Application window. Let's do this. Listen to this song. Listen to this song first. Oops, it helps if I actually turn on, it helps if I turn on the audio. Sorry about that. Was there audio on there? I don't think it was. So sorry. I forgot to tick the little box. Okay, try this one again. Okay. All right. Did you guys hear the audio there okay? Yeah, we heard it. Okay. It's a pretty lame song. It's an old Australian uh, folk song. Okay. 
Hold on, hold on, hold on. Okay. Um, however, in 1981, uh, there was an Australian band called, called Men at Work, and they uh, had a, um, a music video, which I'm about to play you now. But what I want you to do is, when listening to this music video, there's a guy with a flute. Um, it appears early at the start, all right? So just think of that melody that you've just heard. It goes Okay. So just try and visualize that in your head. Um, particularly that first bar. So I'm a bit tone deaf. All right. Now I'm going to play this video. Now this, I, I do confess, is the most Australian thing you've probably ever seen in your life. It is hilarious. I'll have to get one of the others to explain to you what this is. Thing, and he punches it. Um, we'll get to that. But I'll bring it up on the screen. I'm going to have to set it. So it's about three or four minutes long. But I want you to listen, particularly at about 30 seconds in, where, where the guy is sitting with a flute on a tree. Okay. Here we go. See if we can manage this. Right. Okay. We've got a lot to unpack there. Uh, any Australians want to uh, want to kick off with um, what what, uh, what 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 exactly was going on there? The national anthem. Yeah, nice. Okay. So a couple of things. First things first. No one drinks Fosters in Australia. No, no one. No one. That's that's just some sort of weird cultural myth that seems to have been gathered by. And, uh, encouraged by Paul Hogan and, and all of the Poms. So Fosters, for whatever reason, people think they drink Australia. Australians don't drink Fosters. That's my first thing. Second thing, I better turn the, I'm going to turn YouTube back on. All right, YouTube's back on now. Uh, second thing, what Australians explain what this is? Will they, will they hold the thing and punch it? Yeah, AFL, which again is a meaningless abbreviation to anyone outside. Australia, Australian rules football, which for those that haven't lived in any of the states other than New South Wales and, uh, and Queensland or the ACT, is what everyone else plays instead of rugby league. Um, Australia is that we live in one of the rugby states. That's what we play here. We, we um, don't have much in the way of AFL. This is the bastion city of rugby league, probably anywhere in the world. And uh, sport being a big part of Australian culture. Um, it's probably worth just having for a bit of a laugh, going and watching these guys punching the ball and wandering around with the singlets and the short shirts and, and the referees going like this when they um, when they score goals. It's a, a bit of a laugh. Okay, um, and other from a, a bunch of other cringy things about Vegemite sandwiches and so on like that, and hopping along the desert and kangaroos and and so on. Um, the, a couple of things to note. The important bit for our point is the um, is the flute, because the flautist wanted to create uh, an a classical Australian sound. Um, what is the problem with that? Trying to create a classically Australian contemporary folk song uh, type sound. That first piece of work that I showed you was still in copyright. And so that is a problem because that song is essentially infringing the rights of the copyright holders to the Kookaburra song that we had just earlier. And so they went to, um, went to court. In fact, people hadn't even noticed this. So it wasn't until 20 years after the song was published, there was a television show called called um, Spicks and Specs. And uh, there was a quiz question on there, which was, which Men at Work song has or derives the score from the Kookaburra song? Um, and no one had really noticed this in public. And so then anyway, this ended up going to court because they people who turns out still owned the copyright on that particular piece, um, wanted royalties. 
Um, and really quite sad. It's a pretty sad case because in the end, um, you know, it, it's one of those examples of, uh, of litigation, litigation and law, not being able to resolve things is, um, is problematic. The guy actually killed himself. It was actually really um, because they lost and they had to pay back a huge big chunk of royalties. And I think also it was this idea that, you know, this, that song, that band never really had any other hits after that. And so this was essentially this guy's magna opus, the greatest thing that um, they created in their entire life. Um, and uh, yeah, it was really kind of sad. I really kind of sad that whole thing. But the key thing to take away from this is just be really careful when you are using music in your own works because it can come back and bite you. And in that case, it came back and bit them 30 years later, um, which was a real shame. Um, and it cost them a lot of money. Okay, any questions on that? I'm going to go through uh, and talk about copyright. Um, I'm going to talk about some specific aspects of copyright. Oh, I've got about, uh, yeah, we've got a bit to go. So I'll talk about the um, the next thing, so the creation of right. It might just take just a short break. We did start a little bit late. Um, I'll just take just a couple of minutes, two or three minutes. Um, does anyone have any questions on this so far? Even though we're only a few slides in. <laughs> Those that can't read the chat, taking the subject nine years later just to get men and work in, uh, in class. Yeah, good, good, good job, lad. Good job. All right, we'll take it just a couple of minutes. Um, I'll just go, like, literally two minutes. Let's go and have a quick drink. Okay, all right. A couple of things you need to uh, need to guarantee when you're going and doing copyright. Uh, first thing is the um, uh, is originality. So regardless of what you're creating, you, the particular piece must actually have to be original. Um, now, going to the the example of that I had of the Triple J compilation, that if you are taking bits of material from elsewhere and deriving something new, that can still be original in itself. So the Triple J compilation was new, um, and so it satisfied that originality. Um, these two cases here, um, the desktop marketing case in 2002 and Telstra and phone directories in, uh, in 2010, um, they're actually based on kind of similar facts. It's actually to do with um, phone books and the idea of taking uh, phone books, bits of information that are out there, a collection of phone numbers, and then creating a work from that uh, is a, um, it can be uh, a separate piece of work itself. That's a derived work, much like the Triple J compilation. Um, and so, for example, uh, with desktop marketing and Telstra, going through all of the phone numbers and creating a, a, a you know, writing them out again. Um, that could actually be um, original work in onto itself if you're actually going through and, and, and compiling and deriving things from that. However, if you write a piece of software to do that, um, it's probably not. So uh, again, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the concept of screen scraping. Um, that's where you write a little script that, that browses to a website. I've done one oh, relatively recently to go to the JCU um, Study Finder app. Just go to the URL, 
go to this course, grab all the information, get the subject name, get the code, get the subject learning outcomes, get those things, get the lecturer's name, and then storing it locally. Now, what they said in this Telstra and Phone Directory's case is that that, um, it, there's a question of degree involved as part and parcel of that, but if it's just done automatically, you write a piece of software that just got to copy stuff, it's probably not gonna have uh, copyright. So me, for example, getting that information and compiling it somewhere, um, if I'm just doing that automatically, it doesn't have this aspect of authorship. It's not going to be original. So it's not going to satisfy uh, the rules to be um, to be uh, copyright in that case. Uh, then ICTV and Nine uh, Nine Network case that involved. Uh, it's so funny. These the technology is all antiquated. Uh, the TV guidebooks. They're trying to argue that the TV guidebook, which is just taking list of TV shows, is actually not an original work. And I said, actually, no, it is. It is. It can be. There is this aspect of authorship that comes with it. Okay. Um, next one is... All right. So what's a work? What do we mean? Uh, literary, dramatic, musical, artistic, protected categories of works. They're things that um, that you go through and you can do, and they are protected in the, in the copyright legislation. Um, now, we use the word, the word work as a technical uh, term, and so that there are other kinds of things which are still protected under copyright, but they are not called works as such. Um, so that there are sound recordings, films, radio broadcasts, TV broadcasts, and published editions. Um, what they mean there, and the reason why they've used a different term to describe that, is that where you've got uh, sound recordings, films, radio broadcasts, often there's multiple factors coming into this. There's multiple aspects in terms of uh, literary sources, multiple uh, aspects of dramatic sources. So, uh, so what they've done, just in terms of the copyright legislation, they've they've moved them into two sort of different and distinct places. If you see that term being used, works refer to those things at the top, whereas the, um, the protected non-works uh, refer to things at the bottom. And if you kind of look at those sort of conceptually, it's largely because um, authorship is essential. It's an essential concept with copyright, who the author is. And that's really hard when you've got large companies because authorship, by default, actually flows from natural persons. It actually flows from people themselves. So that uh, even if um, you know, you've got a team of people and they come together and create a company, the authorship is actually going to be keyed to the people and often keyed to their lives in terms of the length and duration, which I'll get to. All right. Oh, there's my next slide where it talks about authorship. There we go. The author. Um, all right, so there's a couple of things. These are um, some technical points about authorship here. Um, one of them is that by default, if you are the author of works, you are the creator, you own the copyright. Okay, that's the starting point. And if there's a team of you, uh, the authorship of works is jointly, your own work jointly. If you can't work out who made what. So if three people collaborate on a project, if, as with oh, literally this book here, in fact, oh, that book there, this one's pretty easy because the textbook has broken up into chapters. And so each of the contributing authors owns the particular chapter that they wrote. Um, that's how that works. That's easy. You can divide that up. All right. We like we can almost think of it like tenancy in common, except you don't have a percentage of the whole thing. You actually own the individual chapter. Um, whereas if all of the authors contributed together and helped each other, and you couldn't work out who did what, then they're going to own the works jointly. What does that mean in terms of uh, like when we talk about joint tenancy? What are some what are some features of joint tenancy? Everything is split. All together. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. That's right. So those things there. And you have things like rights of survivorship and other bits and pieces. All right. Now, um, this is one of those <laughs> this is one of those cases where citizenship actually matters. So you get protection under the Copyright Act, and you appreciate it, but 
this is a good thing. You're only getting rights, you get no duties here. So if you produce stuff and you are an Australian citizen, not just permanent resident, is actually citizen. Oh no, it does say resident, sorry. Resident or resident or citizen, sorry. Um, if you produce works anywhere in the world, you have protection under the Australian copyright regime. Or if works are created but first published in Australia, but the publisher of those works, regardless of citizenship or residency, will gain rights under the copyright regime in Australia. So it's an and or, you can double dip in these things. So that, for example, if you were, um, you know, say US citizens and you create the works in the US, but you first publish them in Australia, you'll be able to use both the uh, American copyright protections as well as the Australian ones. Okay, now this is a really important one here. An employee producing works in the scope of employment if you make stuff while on the clock, the employer owns stuff. That's essentially how that works. Now there is some, a few exceptions to this, but uh, that's the starting point. And so it's actually an interesting one. Things have come up with universities in recent times in terms of the universities exerting copyright across um, their employees. They're academics as part of it. Now it's a little bit, little bit tricky. It's tricky because the um, the actual contracts the academics have allow for things. And so I, for example, was going to have a Barney. I'm sure, and I'm sure there's a non-zero chance that I still will. But I'm very, very confident I'm going to come out fine um, over a piece of software that I wrote last year um, because part of the time that I spent was on, it wasn't under my particular employment contract, but it was under a, um, uh, for a grant. And we had to go back, I had to go back and look and see what the university's um, sort of uh, contractual rules with the enterprise agreement and their um, particular procedures and their policies that applied for that. And thankfully, <laughs> works have to be commissioned, have to actually be asked for by the, um, the institution in order for that to happen. So writing things of your own volition, thankfully, uh, probably gonna see me fine. They still ask for it, but we just said no. And then they didn't ask after that. So I'm, sh I'm shrugging my shoulders. Okay, and, um, and so some exceptions here. Uh, so first of all, by default, if you're on the clock, your employer owns the fruits of your labor. And that includes all of the um, intellectual property that you produce. Uh, while you're doing that. Um, so that again, this is subject to contractual uh, things. So I remember when my then girlfriend and ex-wife arrived at JCU back in 2006, she had checked her contract, which specifically said that the teaching staff own their teaching materials. So she can pick it up and take it and go to another employer. I'm not sure if I'm under the same rules, probably not. Um, and I have to go back and check. Actually, I'm not sure, but no one's no one seemed to really care, so I haven't I haven't pushed it too much. Okay, um, but uh, just note one of the exceptions is to do with journalists. There's actually in the Copyright Act. Look, copyright's kind of a quirky one, and that um, politics jumps into it a lot. Uh, and so that this particular rule, the um, the whatever the press association jumped up and down when the copyright act was put in and they made them put this thing. So oddly, just for that particular you know, niche group of people, which is journalists, they have a right under the act itself to put all of their articles into a book. Um, there's some other really quick ones. So they, um, if ever you want to do, do a bit of light reading on this, um, when I mentioned that Mickey Mouse was problematic, the other thing problematic in the UK copyright is Peter Pan, that one MP to support that bill insisted that the UK Copyright Act have a specific section in it that allows one school somewhere in Western England to perform the, the pantomime of Peter Pan once a year or something just outrageous like that. So Parliament had to go through and insert that in in order to get the um, uh, enough assent on that bill. Anyway, it's got some quirky things uh, that comes as part and parcel of it. All right, when I say that you own it, that's fine and good you can give it away. What's that, give it away? Give it away for some money. So that you can, um, it's, an, it's, a, it's a form of property. It's an intangible form of property. You can uh, transfer it uh, by assignment. It has to be in writing. Um, 
and you can put it in your will, you can leave it to somebody if you die, and through operation of law, if you become bankrupt, uh, the copyright will be vested in your trustee in bankruptcy, for example, um, or if you become um, uh, incapable of dealing with your affairs, the public trustee can um, have that vested to them. Okay, um, you can, uh, and this is again governed by the Copyright Act itself, you can limit the rights for people to use your works, with you, if you own the copyright, you can limit them in terms of scope. You can say, you can copy this, but you can only sell it, for example, in the state of New South Wales. Uh, remember, it's, it's federal law, so you can make these sorts of rules. Or you can only distribute it in the suburbs of Douglas, a suburb of Douglas, uh, for example. Um, so you can actually go through and carefully map these things out. Um, and you would do that, again, as part of the contractual arrangement. But the Copyright Act gives some force, gives some power for you to sort of scope, sculpt those things as you go. Um, and again, you have to, to assign these things, you have to do it in writing. Um, and much like I mentioned when we talked about um, transactions for the sale of land, which have to be in writing, yeah, sometimes that causes a grave injustice. And we know that there's area of law known as equity. And sometimes equity can intervene if there's something problematic about the transfer and it creates some form of injustice. In Australia, the term we use is unconscionable. If, it, if the requirements of writing weren't met, but in situations where it would be unconscionable for another party to, um, to deny that that particular assignment had happened, um, you'd be able to seek a remedy in equity. Okay. Flick it over to YouTube. How long do they last? Again, this is where good old Mickey Mouse comes into it. All right. Um, the old rules were the life of the last author plus 50. But I mentioned before that the Americans uh, jump up and down. They jumped up and down about 15, 16 years ago. And they said, oi you need to increase it from 50 to 70. And this, and John Howard said, okay. And so they did. So they, they increased that. So what that has meant is that I think since 2005 or six, that the year hasn't changed. It's still sitting uh, on, I think it's 1955. Yeah, I think it's 1955. So works, that were created up into the 30, so if the, if the author who created a particular work died before the 1st of January 1955, um, those works remain in copyright, okay? Because what happened, when they changed the rule, they increased it, but they didn't do it gradually. They just said, we will freeze it in time for 20 years until that's caught up, because what, I found when I was a when I was a young lad, and again, uh, Marie, you might remember this. Batana, probably not, um, and I'm not sure about other jurisdictions. Um, Abhishek and you know some of you guys may be aware of similar rules in your home countries. It used to be on the first of January, you would get a list of all of the works that were now in the public domain. In other words, the copyright had expired because the author had died 50 years before. When they increased it to 70 years, it hasn't moved, and we are still in this transitional period. So it won't be until the 1st of January, I think 2025. Um, I'd have to check that. It might be 2024, but I think it's 25. Um, when that happens, from that year onwards, on the 1st of January, a, a new set of authors who died in the relevant year, 1955, 1956, 1957, and so on, um, that after they died the seven, and, and the seven years has expired, their work's come to the public domain. And again, that was going to be extremely problematic for Walt Disney, who died in the 60s. Um, but the American one has a strange sort of corporate system as well. Um, so just make note, if it's joint uh, authorship, regardless of who owns the copyright, and you, you note, by the way, it doesn't matter who owns the copyright. This is one of those curious things about this area of law. You, um, and for example, uh, J.R.R. Tolkien, the guy who wrote The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. So, assuming that it was in Australia, we use Australian rules here, he died in 1971, I think, give or take. Uh, and so, in whatever it is, 20, 26 years' time, when, that, uh, when it's been 70 years since he died, is it 73? Okay, so it'll be quite a few years away. But it, it, um, 
either way, in our lifetimes, there'll be a certain point in time where all of his books become public domain. Everyone will be able to freely copy them just as we can freely copy um, works before 1955. We can freely just do what we like. We can copy them, distribute them, uh, parody them, and no one can do anything about it, um, which is going to be uh, interesting to see how that works and uh, all of these little touristy things in New Zealand. Um, but that's essentially how that's going to how that's going to fly. Now, again, derived works such as all of the Lord of the Rings movies, um, such as the Hobbit films, such as the you know the use of Hobbiton and the creative, all of that derived stuff is still going to survive because that's derived works. Um, now Peter Jackson and the guy who runs the Hobbiton, they still have to pay um, the the rights holders to the Hobbit and the Lord of the Rings money every year. Uh, very, very lucrative um, piece of uh, piece of copyright. Um, they have to pay them every single year for, um, for using the, that likeness. And in 26 years time, that will expire. So they won't have to pay those particular royalties anymore. Um, and they'll still be able to do and carry on doing things. And they will still be able to sue people that create things that look just like Hobbiton or that look just like all of the things that they've gone through and created as derived works. Okay, uh, there's a couple of other things as well. Copyright uh, photos, engraving, sound recordings, um, again, because they're a little bit, um, they're just a little bit different in terms of creation. They, um, they have a slight different statutory rule. Uh, it's from the date of publication, uh, again, plus the end of the calendar year. They all tick over on the 1st of, pardon me. They all tick over on the 1st of January each year. So just make note, that's just how things work. Um, so on the 1st of January, you can check, as I said, it'll be about another five years before they start ticking over. And uh, copyright and sound intelligent broadcast is the date of, oh, it's the date of broadcasting. So again, things that have been um, broadcast in Australia in the, what are we, 50s, 60s, 50 years? Uh, yeah, about 19, well, it'll be 1970. Onwards, so those things. If you people have made recordings, and that's going to be interesting because um, VCRs started to become a thing uh, from the early 80s onwards, um, and so that's something. Look, Australia, particularly with public broadcasting in the 70s, is it's considered to be a public good, and so as such, the ABC has a charter to go and distribute things to the public as much as they can. And so you can use uh, things, the ABC iView, you guys heard of iView? Um, that gives you the ability to go through and just do things. Australia has a very well-funded public broadcasting system. Um, where that is going to be um, interesting is broadcast for things like cricket games from, again, it'll be 1970 onwards because the private channels, Channel 9, um, they started to have cricket games when one day cricket started to be a phenomenon around by the time I was born. <laughs> in 1977, if, in May 1977, if anybody needs to know. Um, and so that's the, um, that's that's why those broadcasts will start to be, uh, again, they'll start to move into the, the public domain in Australia. Um, so you'll be able to freely watch old cricket games. That said, YouTube pretty much lets you do things like that anyway. It's kind of a moot point. Okay, uh, next one. All right, so what happens when things go wrong? If people start infringing your copyright, what does that mean? All right, well, so by default, copyright, the person who owns the copyright and has that or has them assigned to them or given to them somehow, they have an exclusive monopoly right to reproduce that stuff. Um, that includes to adapt it, to, to perform it, to publish it, to do things with it. And a person who does does any of those things, uh, which is the, the next section here, an act comprised in the copyright without authorization, has committed an infringement under the Copyright Act. Um, so again, uh, and that also includes in Section 38, the selling, hiring, or exhibiting um, and trade um, copyrighted material. These are infringements, all right? And we'll get to what can happen if there is an infringement, but these, all of these things are ways that a person can infringe your copyrights. So if you create some works, um, it gives you that exclusive right. If other people do any of these things, it's an infringement within the meaning of the Copyright Act, and we'll be able to seek some form of remedy. Um, so that includes, yeah, Hina.
Hina? There is some problem with, with this. It happened in our yesterday's lecture as well. Okay, I'll turn. So your voice is breaking from the past five minutes. Is that a little better now with the video off? No, it, it's the it's the, the blackboard. It was issue yesterday. And it's yeah, but in, I think it's your problem because we are here. Um, we are hearing the Simon properly. Oh, okay, okay. Oh, okay. On your side. Um, so, Hina, what that means, if you can hear me, it means that it'll, it'll go cleanly into the recording itself. Um, so, if, you, if there is internet bandwidth at um, the client end, so if your guys end, um, you'll always be able to go back through the recordings either from YouTube or from um, Collaborate. So, um, if that does pop up, um, and there's probably, if, if you're having bandwidth issues, sometimes it comes up with a um, a little quality thing in the list of attendees, but I think it's fine at the moment. Okay, so um, just make note that one of the types of infringement is to do with importation. So if you import things into Australia that are copyrighted, in, in other words, owned by a copyright holder in Australia, um, you can, um, it's an infringement, and we can seek some sort of remedy. That also includes what we call parallel imports. That is where, you actually um, purchase goods in another jurisdiction. Oh, yeah, Emmanuel, yep. So Simon, for each country, we have to get a separate copyright? There will be, there will be copyright. Copyright. You might just turn you might your mic off. There will be copyright rules in each jurisdiction. Um, here, we're obviously concerned with the ones here. And, what you can find though is that you can purchase goods in one country where the copyright rules you've satisfied either because they're not part of the international copyright agreements um, or there is no copyright relevant copyright law there and you can purchase those goods perfectly legal perfectly legally so for example in um, we say North Korea I get the North Koreans a bit of stick but we'll just say that they're not party to a whole bunch of international agreements um, if you purchase goods perfectly lawfully in North Korea and then import them into Australia, the fact that you lawfully bought them in North Korea is actually completely irrelevant for the purposes of determining whether they're going to breach Australian copyright. So that if you have works and you create works, um, and again, this can happen through the internet, then people go elsewhere and they copy them, then bring them back into Australia. It doesn't change the fact that you still own the Australian copyright. So if you um, write, for example, some software, um, you write it, um, a little game of some sort, and then it, uh, others try to import it into Australia, then you can um, seek some sort of remedy because they're infringing it. Um, hope that, hope that makes sense even though you might have lawfully purchased the thing in another country, uh, which is a little unintuitive, but um, that is just the way the, the rules work. Again, generally, we find that countries uh, that you deal with um, have uh, treaties. Yeah, there's a whole series of treaties. It's called the TRIPS Agreement, the General um, uh, Copyright um, International Agreements that they have for these things. All right, now, this is an important one. These are not infringements. And I haven't actually argued with the library here. The library staff at JCU, they're the ones that, um, that deal with this. And uh, I will say they're probably the copyright experts, so I might think. Um, at JCU, uh, Rachel Bradshaw in, in Cairns is the, um, is the sort of the expert on copyright. It's her area. Um, but there are certain defences. In other words, when I say it's a defense, it's actually to do with the fact that if you are doing or are undertaking this, um, this what we call fair dealing, it's not going to be an infringement, okay? And there's a couple of different ways that that can, that can happen. Um, the first thing to note is that um, if you borrow a book from a library, you're not infringing uh, on copyright. That's just part and parcel. And it seems very logical, but you actually have to spell that out because in theory, every book a library would have, in theory, if it didn't have this exception, you'd have to seek the copyright's permission to lend it. That would be a very difficult task. Okay, you guys are probably aware of the 10% rule. Does it sound familiar? 
here's an example of a book. All right, you can copy up to 10%. You can literally can go and photocopy 10% of a book. Uh, this book has 833 pages. 10% of that, quite easy, probably rounds up to 84 pages. Um, or a chapter, and again, it's in uh, the bigger of the two. So if this book only had three chapters, you could do a chapter. Um, as it happens, it's got 29 chapters. So 83 pages is probably the one you'd want to be doing. So you can do that for personal use uh, or performing works at home, which is very interesting now that Zoom has become something of a phenomenon. That's an interesting point. Actually, I'm going to follow up on that point. I didn't think of that till just then. Um, uh, for educational purposes, again, that's that's the fair dealing that what we deal with at JCU. Um, legal proceedings, giving professional advice, uh, review, criticism, or news reporting. So all of those things, the fair dealing rule is still the 10% or one chapter. Okay, because largely when you're giving review or criticism, you can read the whole thing, an original, but if you are quoting bits out of it, there's only 10% um, of it. If you are quoting things for um, legal proceedings, I mean, if for whatever reason some person wanted to quote something from there, 10% um, they would do without having to have um, uh, copyright. That's just that's just a, uh, essentially a defense to actions under our act. Um, okay, if it's... Um, Oh, this Polo Loren company in Ziziliani. Um, there is a rule that says that, look, um, you can, <laughs> when you're importing stuff, if the particular copyright is actually just to do with the package, a label, a container, or a warranty document, uh, that's not going to be an infringement. All right? And so this Polo Loren company in Ziziliani uh, involved some people deliberately importing um, uh, you know, Polo Loren argument uh, logo shirts. It's like brand. If you have a fancy brand, you say Laurent or Armani or uh, oh, name some brands. I'm not very good at this. Um, expensive Italian brands. Um, if you do import those, and again, this is one of the arguments they tried to use as a, a defense here. Oh, it's only a label. And they said, of course, they said no. Uh, it's it, the um, the brand that logo is part and parcel of the particular um, product that's important. It's it's an integral part of it, not merely a procedural aspect to it, a container warranty document. So you can't argue that a, a sticker which labels something to identify it, um, you know, this is 100 shirts, is quite different from the carefully embroidered uh, logo of the Polo Loren company. Um, all right, and again, uh, when, I talked about, when I talked about that infringement, I mentioned North Korea. If the particular country that, we're, that the thing is imported from, so you've bought something lawfully in another jurisdiction, who are a party to either of these agreements, in other words, Australia has already signed up to these things to say, okay, that will not be an infringement when they bring them in, um, provided they are party to those agreements, which I said many countries are, but you know, I'm quietly confident North Korea is not. All right, so those are ways that you can, um, oh, those are ways that you can kind of get away with using works um, that we're using as part and parcel. And that may be relevant for you guys, particularly doing research. Okay, um, so if one side has infringed on your copyright, you can, under the Act, get an injunction to stop them and get an account of profits, or get damages. Um, the reason why I say or to those last two is that they're kind of mutually exclusive. Damages is an award to compensate you for harm that you can demonstrate, whereas an account of profits is to compensate you for money that another party has made by using your copyright. So you're allowed either or of those two. But you can always seek an injunction as part of that. Um, you can bring action conversion, in other words, you can ask the court under section 116 to get all of the infringing copies and, and give them to you, um, all the mechanism. So if you've got um, a particular, like a stamping machine that stamps the things, you can go through and, and ask the court to deliver that to you as well. Um, you can get uh, what's called an Anton Pillar order, that's a particular order, usually you get them in equity, but the court uh, does allow for copyright as well. Um, 
very, very rare and very hard to obtain. If you can prove to a court that the um, uh, a particular entity that you can't get the evidence for them, but you can demonstrate that they have and are in the process of infringing your copyright. Get point two. I'll I'll just back up Ravnit for point two. Um, an action and conversion. That's a tort. So you can bring an, an action under the Copyright Act for getting all of the copies of the thing that uh, infringe your copyright. So all of the copies. So say, for example, I've um, written a piece of software and there are, uh, that's often a bad example. I published a book, all right? And somebody has gone, taken my book and photocopied it and given it to all of the um, residents of Douglas, plus they have a warehouse where they've got all of these photocopies of my book, I can ask the court for an order for me recovering the infringement copies. In this particular instance, it would probably only be to get the ones back from the warehouse where they've got all of these copyright, um, copyright infringed copies of my book, uh, but also the mechanism. If they had a printing press that was copying my book, doof, 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 we could also ask for the court to, to get, give that to us as well. Give us the right to enter and seize that stuff. Um, and that second one, the Anton Pillar order is the right to enter into premises and seize documents. Usually, by the way, <laughs> you don't do this on your own. You get the order from the court and you call up the federal police and then they come and do it um, with you. All right. Um, and. If there is an infringement, you can also sue in other areas of law as well, and you often do. So you can sue for a breach of contract. So in other words, if somebody, you've got a contract with somebody for them to produce works for you, and then they just go secretly hide them and then go and sell copies of the works that, that you own the copyright for, you can sue them for breach of contract as part of that, as well as infringements under the Copyright Act. You can sue them for breach of confidence if you give them information and confidence as part of that process. Um, you can sue for misleading and deceptive conduct under Section 18 of the Australian Consumer Law and the tort of passing off um, if others are pretending to be you and they're, li they're um, trading off your brand and your goodwill. Um, that's, that's what those things are. Those are the remedies you can seek. So it's a combination of things under the common law or other areas of law, as well as specific sections in the Copyright Act, sections 115 and 116. Okay, last thing I just want to mention about copyrights, actually quite a new, oh yeah, Nathan, yeah. Sorry, I was asking, uh, if we photocopy something for our personal use, just like one copy of one book, does it still come under Copyrights Act? Fair dealing, the exception, will only apply if it's 10% or one chapter, whichever is higher. Right. Will not apply. If you photocopy a book for personal use, yes, you are breaching copyright. What about yes. like Microsoft software? Like yep, see, absolutely. Still yep. under there. Yep. So, yeah. This is, for us, it is kind of weird because I'm coming from Sri Lanka. We don't care at all. Like we just keep photocopying whatever the book we get in from the yep. place. In, right. yep. in New Zealand in the 1980s, I um, I would freely copy software um, because the legal protections weren't in there now. Now, if you're in Australia, you look, I'm going to give this piece of advice. I'm happy to go on record for this. You should get a VPN. If you guys don't know what a VPN is, you should find out. If you are doing anything that involves anything involved in copyright, because you would be very surprised uh, what the federal government can and can't do. Why? A friend of mine got a letter, a former student, about something called the Dallas Buyers Club. I'll write it out in the uh, in the chat. You can do a little bit of research about this, but I'll, I'll briefly explain what it is. Dallas Buyers. Oh no, yeah, you're right. They're not. Um, but it's a very good start. Um, the reason why VPN isn't, strictly speaking, sufficient is actually to do with the rules of evidence um, with VPNs because the mechanism the, the um, feds have to use to get into VPNs, you know, in most situations, they're probably going to have a hard time adducing that as evidence to a court. It's not so much that they can't get into it. Um, if you're doing something really, really, that you, you really, really don't want 
people say you probably need a double VPN. In other words, you need to create a virtual private network to a computer elsewhere, and then get that computer to create another one. Um, that's how you'd go about um, about doing those. But I'm going to tell you about the D Dallas Buyers Club because a friend of mine, former student, got a letter from the Dallas Buyers Club. Very interesting piece of law, this, because what had happened, and uh, you may have heard of this movie. It's a movie, it wasn't a very big movie, it didn't have a huge budget. What happened though, quite cleverly and quite scarily, is that the big American movie companies all got together and they created an Australian company, all right, and they gave it a little bit of money to um, go to court and uh, the rights to the Dallas Buyers Club. So it became the copyright holder of that particular um, movie in Australia. So then what Dallas, the, it was, I think it was even called Dallas Buyers Club Proprietary Limited, okay? So it was owned by these American companies. So what, what they then did was to go to a small, not a tiny, but a, a small or mid-sized internet service provider and say, we have obtained, and again, how they managed to do this, I don't know, uh, information that says people are infringing copyright and downloading this movie. We would like um, an, an injunction, a managed injunction, making you give us their names. And they went to court and they won. They actually got the right to do that. So then they sent a letter out to like 500 people in Australia saying, please pay $17 to us. And uh, and if you, as you can imagine, people were a little bit scared because they just copied this movie from somewhere, including said one of my former students. And it went on appeal to the full federal court and Dallas Buyers Club lost and they lost spectacularly. Uh, but it didn't make any difference because the company that they'd set up just quietly folded. It was an experiment by the big American movie producers to try and get the, um, you know, really try and get the stuff enforced and set a precedent in the courts to try and get it enforced. It failed miserably, thankfully, but note that they couldn't do it with a big movie and they couldn't do it against a big internet service provider. So they were never going to do it to Telstra or Optus. They had to take a little one. So that um, the guys at TPG or whoever it was that they ended up um, doing it. It had a very, very negative impact on them, all of this litigation. Um, so anyway, but the, the moral of the story is get a VPN, even if it's just a basic one like Nord. Um, you know, yes, yes, people can probably get in, they can probably can go through and check that, but you, they may not be able to adduce it as evidence in a court. That's my two cents on that. Um, the last thing I'm going to mention in copyright is what are called moral rights. Moral rights are not the same as substantive copyrights. They don't give you any of the rights to get an injunction, to get an account of profits or anything like that. The one thing, or I suppose three things, but on the screen there is that they have these rights in perpetuity. If you're the author of something, you have, to the end of time, the right to be identified as the author, you have the right to stop others from attributing themselves as being the author, and you get this right to, to um, um, protect your work from derogatory um, or prejudicial uh, treatment. Now, it's actually interpreted a little bit more narrowly than that. It's actually to do with the work itself. Okay, so what does that mean? It means that if I'm an employee and I'm working for an employer, we'll say JCU, let's say JCU owns all my intellectual property, all right, I still have the right to have my name associated with it, to be identified as the author of that particular thing, even if I don't own the underlying copyright behind it. And the reason for that is to, um, yeah, it's, it. it's, it's relatively recent that this has gone in. Um, yeah, and the reason for this is that the people who are gonna be using and exploiting the copyright um, are often are different from the authors themselves. And we've found that in terms of creators, that being attributed as the creator is valuable. Being, uh, and here I'm thinking of um, games, board games, for example. Uh, Class Torba, do you wanna know who Class Torba is? Let's see if I can, see if I can type that up in the screen. Hang on, oh, 
to my little. Oh, no, 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 no. Is it the same time every week? All right, I'm going to have to switch. Ask the university a new computer. It's so bad, eh? It's, um, it's class turbo. Yes, I found the guy anyway. Class turbo. Look, do, do, do. There we go, found their name. I will go, look, I'll close them other tabs. It's probably my problem. How's that? That guy there. All right. So that guy, again, you may or may not know that guy at all. If anybody knows board games, they know who this guy is. He's a German games designer. And he created a board game called The Settlers of Catan, uh, which was released in the year 1996. And it's a, for those that care about board games, it's really a seminal moment in terms of board games and design. That's a certain point where the Germans have been designing and playing all sorts of cool board games for a very long time, um, it actually it started to have international appeal. And that's the point in design where the god-awful board games that we used to play in the 80s, the you know, Monopoly and games like that, um, departed from, uh, in other words, they departed from, um, how do I describe this? You started to have a point in time with board games where designed games, where people who were professional game designers started to be things that moved into the mainstream. You still have the awful board games that you can go and buy at, uh, at Kmart, but you'll also have the much more expensive board games that you buy in specialty game stores. Um, Settlers of Catan being a good example of that. So I highly recommend trying that out. Okay, now, one of the things to note, though, is that the name of the person matters. Um, there's another guy called... Um, that guy, another famous game designer. Um, or designer, creator. He created a um, uh, collectible card game, first big collectible card game called Magic the Gathering. And as you can tell, I am a big nerd. Yeah, I'm a big nerd. I have, yes, sorry. In case you couldn't realize that. And what you find is that the name of the creator is valuable. And being named as the creator is valuable, even if, as the case of Richard Garfield, the actual copyright was already assigned. He created the game on behalf of another guy called Peter Atkinson for a company called Wizards of the Coast. But his name is still associated with that particular thing. And that is a valuable thing. And it is forbidden under our copyright system to change or to try and say that the author was someone else. Even though the author has no substantive rights. They can't seek an account of profits. They can't get damages. They can't get injunctions other than for those specific things. And they can't assign it to anyone else. The fact that you are the author stays with you forever and a day. You can't assign the authorship to another person, even though you can assign the substantive copyright. Does that make sense to you guys? Go and check out those games. They're quite neat. Um, that's a, it's just it's an important thing for commercial practices. This look, this is an area of law that probably will come up in your business life and careers. You guys are doing MBAs. You are going to be involved with the creation in knowledge economies of um, of new ideas that are going to be enshrined in works. Copyright is going to be an, an aspect of your life um, for some of you more than others. But I think knowing those rules and just revising them from time to time when these things come up is probably worthwhile doing, guys. Okay, um, I'm not going to take a break here. I'm just going to carry on, unless you guys want me to take one. I don't think I need to. Um, but we're going to move on to the next area of intellectual property, um, which is um, designs, actually. So I'm going to flick the... Flick, flick, flick. Flick it on YouTube. Flick it over there. All right. Uh, a design is something that relates uh, to... A product okay a particular product if I was to draw uh, and I'm gonna do it in a certain color uh, uh, all right uh, what's an example um, you know what's with this color here I don't like I'm gonna try and draw it on the screen uh, I haven't done this very well at all I can't do it very good no, I did a terrible job. That's a terrible job. That's supposed to look like a Coca-Cola bottle, by the way. Uh, all right. 
Um, like a ghost. It is a terrible job. I did a terrible job. So sorry. Label it. Yeah, they give a label. Well, this is the thing: is that labels is actually to do with the overall visual features of of something, particular product. Uh, um, cars are probably a better one, um, but I'm not capable of drawing uh, like a Ferrari. Um, it's really to do with look. Um, it's designs are, are something that are, that are associate a particular visual. Um, to be like the way a particular product is or can be described from visual features. That's essentially what that is. Um, so the, that is part and parcel of that. Um, so the, the way that the Coca-Cola bottle is shaped is associated with a product. It's not, a, not associated with a brand. It's associated with a product. Um, and that can be registered. You're allowed to go to the designs office, explain it to them, Explain that it is different. Um, we'll say different or distinctive compared with the prior art base. It has to be different in some way. If you can do that um, and demonstrate that it flows from your particular product, you can register that particular design. It's just protected under the statute. Um, now, uh, you can register it or you can publish it. And you can go um, and publish it without registering it and in order to stop others from beating you to it. Um, so that's that's how you um, you go through and, and can do that. And there's a database. It's managed by the, um, the, the designs office. And they register it and they put your little design, little picture and a description of it, and they add it to this particular database. Once you register it, um, you're protected for five years and you can extend that for another five. Um, that's just what you can do and you pay a fee to go through and do that and it gives you much like doing um, with copyright people that infringe on that you, you've just got a straight cause of action under the act you can just literally um, if somebody does create something and it is the layout of the particular product is similar to yours that you've registered the design you can just ask for a remedy under the legislation uh, designs are pretty small small area of law that's essentially that's pretty much it you can register designs a visual features associated with a product, not brand. It's good with accountants. You guys are great because you know what I'm talking about. Um, product, not brand, and it's only visual things, which is different from trademarks we'll get to a little later. All right. Big one and probably more interesting is patents. All right. So patents are again an exclusive right it's a right to exploit something that you have created all right and in order to register a patent you have to tell people about it more importantly you have to tell the patents office one of the things about patents is that it is in to do with the inventions again this um, a secondary type of patent we have in our system called an innovation patent, which is just an innovative step. But primarily here, I'm, I'm thinking of inventions. If you create something new that is novel, useful, not already in the public domain and inventive in some way, you get and you go and take the, that design or the, the how to build the particular thing, give it to the patents office for them to check and they give you a big tick and you pay a fee, you get a monopoly right to, to exploit that particular invention. Okay, Patents are about telling the world all about your thing to get a monopoly right to exploit it. Okay, and here I'm thinking first of pharmaceuticals. Um, because a lot of money goes into creating new forms of pharmaceuticals, new drugs, okay? And the drug companies have the, an incentive to pour billions of dollars into that because they get the monopoly right to exploit it. And I'm gonna use uh, a couple of examples of drugs as an example. Uh, does anyone here, oh, maybe I'm not sure if I should ask this question. Does anyone remember the 80s? It might only be me. No, wasn't alive. Thanks. Good I'm not Rico, that I do. Most of us <laughs> were born in the eighties. Hypothetically, the no. Okay. Well, 
for those that are too polite to, uh, to, to, to go through this, I remember the 80s. One of the particularly useless piece of trivia I remember from the 80s is paracetamol. Paracetamol, what we call the brand name, the main brand name they have is Panadol. That's the main brand name. There's a reason why that's the main brand name because in the 80s, there was only Panadol because they owned the patent and it was very expensive. Very, very expensive. So the equivalent now, a pack, cost you uh, like $11 in the equivalent. All right. How much does a packet of Panadol, sorry, how much does a packet of paracetamol, home brand paracetamol cost now from the supermarket? 70 cents? Yeah. Dollar? Not much. Why? The patent ran out. Um, I'm going to tell you this piece of information, and you feel free to not. Uh, uh, it's fine. You can think of think whatever me you like. Um, in I believe it was 1997, uh, a company called Pfizer patented a drug called Viagra. Now I know what Viagra is. Hopefully, I'm not going to get five and talk about Viagra in my um, my business law subject. I highly Viagra. doubt people are going to come up and say, "Yes, we know Viagra." Oh yes, I know all about it. I know, but I never used. Yeah, let me um, give you a recommendation. <laughs> Viagra in the 1980s. Oh, sorry, 1990s, late 1990s. Um, it was all a bit of a running joke. It is for erectile dysfunction in middle-aged men, um, and so. What you would find that if you went to purchase blue pill, yes, the blue pill. If you go to purchase, uh, it's sildafinil, the chemical name for uh, for that, or the common name. Um, if you went to purchase Viagra in 1997, it would set you back. Four pills would set you back uh, about I don't know, the equivalent of about $150 for four pills. Okay. And again, I'm not going to ask. I'm just going to tell you, buying the equivalent product now costs between in Australia, and this is a, about $10, 10, 10 to 15. Oh, someone got their mic on? No, okay. Um, why is that? Because the patent ran out. It was a 20 year uh, patent. The patents ran out, so now it's what's called generic. You can just go and buy it. That is why patent law is important to know because, and I look, I hope that you guys are involved with something at some stage where you're going to have to make a decision if you've invented something as to what to do because yeah Ravneet. Uh, are you talking about the brand or just the you know solutions or the salts they use not uh, the brand patent? they're not brand it's the steps to recreate the drug itself all right the process to do it's like a recipe and once you've got that particular thing the ability to sell that, to use that invention as such um, in, uh, in a particular jurisdiction, in Australia, for example. So that, that idea that unlike um, uh, software or artistic works or books that are protected by copyright, pharmaceuticals are, are protected by patents uh, because we want people to publish how this that stuff is created to the world um, because that's going to be good for, for everybody to know how this thing works. Once you've got that right, then you have the monopoly right to exploit it. Yes, Emmanuel. How come as a medicine get a generic right? Generic um, medicine is only lawfully allowed to be sold when the patent has expired. That's why you can get generic paracetamol, generic uh, sildafinol, which is Viagra. You can get generic aspirin. You can get generic, a whole bunch of, of drugs because the patents, because they were in, uh, invented and the patents were registered, and again, specifically in Australia, they were registered more than 20 years ago. And after 20 years, it expires. Now, um, just for, you, again, your own research, particularly those that are from the subcontinent, very, very, very interesting um, what's happening in the world at this very moment involving uh, pharmaceuticals um, because you guys are probably aware which country produces 70% of the world's generic drugs? I guess India. 
Yeah, it's definitely India. Definitely India. However, the stuff, the compounds that they need to um, uh, manufacture it from, a massive fraction of those come from which country? A country which has been a little naughty. A country which has been a little naughty. Yeah, they come from China. So that you're finding that the generic drug manufacturers in India are having difficulties with supplies in China um, because the Chinese are deliberately withholding um, those things. And as you can imagine, all sorts of other countries are jumping up and down about that because it's um, it's problematic, particularly is that um, you know, with COVID coming around, the ability to make, you know, manufacture a lot of medication for the probably the entire world, but certainly the citizens of India themselves is now governed by the Communist Party of China. So you've got this, the, the, there's some problematic things are happening. It's a, it's a very, uh, very interesting point in history that we live in at the moment. It's going to be, um, and what happens in regards to the Indo, Indo-Sino relationship is, is a very, very important relationship for the world. Um, it's, yeah, Emmanuel, yep. How long a patent can be valid? And one Pines. more question. Yeah, one yep. more question. Yep. It's like Coca-Cola is a copyright or it's a patent? Coca-Cola is Coca-Cola an interesting one. It's actually none of the above. It's actually a trade secret, which I'll talk about when we do the confidential information, that fifth type of intellectual property, which I do at the end of this lecture. The recipe for Coca-Cola is a trade secret. It was never released to the world because if the patent for Coca-Cola was released to the world back in 1901 or whenever it was um, invented, 20 years later, it would have gone into the public domain and anyone could go through and create stuff. Now, what's the problem with having a trade secret? Reverse engineering. So from the 19, before the First World War, companies were trying to reverse engineer how to make Coca-Cola. So Pepsi is literally trying to make a cola that tastes a bit like Coca-Cola. All of these other generic brand colas have been trying to do this, but strictly speaking, it's a trade secret. It has never actually been released, but in practice, chemists have got so good at reverse engineering that stuff that it's kind of meaningless. The fact that the the recipe for Coca-Cola sits in a vault in the the headquarters of Coca-Cola, and I think it's in Seattle, I'm not sure, um, sits in a vault, but really, it's a little bit of, it's a bit of a joke, really, because everybody could work out what the recipe is. The, um, the chemists have gotten on that. Rafa, yes. So, if they come up with a vaccine for coronavirus, so uh, will they patent it? Otherwise, it will get too expensive. Yes. Well, it will be very interesting. It'll be very, very interesting to see what happens with that, because strictly speaking. Yes, yes, the entity that develops the vaccine first will be able to patent that. Um, However, (laughs) the thing is about patents, the exclusive right to to a period of time to exploit that, but registration requires them to explain and make public. So the moment that people can go and explain how we can go through and do this, yeah, that's right. Paul Rose will patent that's it. And so that that will be patented as part and parcel of that. What I think you'll find in this particular case, I don't think it'll matter. I think whoever comes up with this, I mean, you look at someone like Bill Gates. Bill Gates isn't doing this for the money. The guy's spending like literally like $5 billion um, on it. And, and this is, it's actually a really interesting point. Um, with the word, and particularly for those, uh, which is you know, a good fraction of the class that are um, coming from developing countries to a country like Australia, which is you know, it's wealthy. It's been wealthy you know, relatively per, per capita for a long time. And the one thing you're going to find as time goes by, uh, particularly as life expectancy is a lot higher here, and you've got the ability to go and use the education system, and eventually those that do stay on jump through the massive hurdles to become residents and later citizens. Um, including um, a good friend of mine who just got her PR after like 10 years. She um, is that that point in life where you can go and do what you want to do with your life and you go and do it to do good things in the world. 
Bill Gates is a really interesting example. That guy is really seriously smart. He's a clever dude. Um, and one of the things about accumulating wealth and capital, like I said, he said, he's, he's been quoted a few times recently, he's talking about capitalism, talking about, yeah, he's a big fan of capitalism, he you know, thinks the thing, but he's only leaving like $15 million to each of his kids. You stop and think about that for a second. The guy has had a net worth, probably not as big these days, but it was about $40 billion at some stage. It was the richest, man's richest world for like 20 odd years. Only leaving $15 million to each of his children. Why? Because you don't need more money than that. What are you going to do with it? What's the point? What's the point of living life? What's the point of being alive? You know, oh wow, I can go and play golf all day. Oh, I can have a big yacht. Larry Elson, oh, I'll just have the biggest yacht that I can. What a waste of time. Go and you live your life. Do good things in the world. Um, and that's one thing that it's tricky when you're coming from places where we've had to struggle. Struggle and struggle to survive, struggle to eat, struggle to get educated, struggle to get ahead. Um, reaching a point living in this country, and again, I'll probably take a little break after after this piece of <laughs> pearls of wisdom or terrible pop philosophy, however you take it. And it's something for you guys that um, you know, I'll challenge each of you. You are doing a course you know, which is going to make you more powerful. It's going to probably help you earn more money. It's certainly going to help you for those that are seeking residence. Um, and that that I challenge you when you reach this point where you are sufficient, where you are happy, where you are going and your material needs are set, and I don't want to get all Maslow's hierarchy of needs on you, but to actually think about, well, okay, what are we going to do? If you had a whole bunch of money, what would you do? What would you do with your life? And I've, I've been exposed to people who have gone and done that. A friend of mine, he wrote a piece of software in the 90s. He retired at age 20. What would you do with your life? Um, and you know, in Andrew's case, not much. Um, but he's getting there. I have other friends now um, who have enough money to survive. They have houses. They don't need or want for much more. They're going into the world to do good. Uh, this job here, I don't do this for the money. If I wanted the money, I'd go back, uh, you know, cut code and do like a whole bunch of my other friends have done. It's going and doing what you want to do with your life. And that's a terrifying thing, um, again, particularly for you guys that have come from places where you've, you've had to work hard and you've had to struggle to, you know, to stay, you know, stay alive as part of that. And so that's something, I think, going back to this idea of patents and Bill Gates. Bill Gates is not spending billions of dollars to get rich. Bill Gates is not spending billions of dollars to um, you know, create some sort of legacy so people are going to remember them. People are already going to remember them, sometimes for good things, sometimes for not so good things. Um, it's, it's about doing good in the world. What is the point of all of this money if you're not trying to do good things for this, for this planet, for the people in it? Anyway, that's my two cents on that. That's for you guys to ponder, but at this stage, we're still on Struggle Street. So I am going to take just a two-minute break, and then we're going to come back, and I'll carry on and talk about uh, the two different types of patents. Okay, give me two minutes.
All right. Okay. So in Australia, we have a sort of a two-tier system. If you've got something inventive, you've actually invented something that's new, that's novel, you um, can obtain what's called a standard patent. That's uh, when you go and you do your registration, they will look at the entire thing and the patents office, uh, they're, it's examined by people called patent attorneys. It's the only time you'll ever hear the word attorney used in Australian English, by the way. Attorney is an American English term. The only time we use it is patent attorney, oh, and powers of attorney as well. It's kind of odd that we've retained that word because powers of attorney and patent attorneys have nothing to do with lawyers, nothing at all. They're engineers that go through, look at your particular invention and your the, your instructions of how to how to build the thing and try to work out whether it is novel whether it is an invention whether or not it's an inventive in some ways whether or not it's useful now we'll go through and do that if they give you a tick and you pay a registration fee um, once that's done you will get a, um, a renewable right okay a renewable right you actually have to pay a fee every, I think it's either four or five years. And interestingly, it goes up. I think it's every four years. The fee goes up each time. I think by the end of it, uh, the, the, so the first four years, it's quite a low fee. The final four years is a large fee, It'd be like $10,000. Why do you guys think that is? Uh, because of the benefits or the increasing over time? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, there is. And it, it's really um, creating this incentive. Look, if your incredible invention was actually really good then and you were making money from it, then you don't mind paying more of a fee because you're making lots of money from it. If it wasn't really that good but someone else might be able to use it, then don't pay the fee and it goes into the public domain so others can use it. Um, others can go through and build on your particular uh, your particular invention. So um, it's really a use it or lose it scheme. So you pay more and more money as time goes by. Uh, now this is that's an invention patent or a standard patent. The other type of patent is called an innovation patent. Usually that's where there's already an existing process, and you're just making some part of it better. So there's already something existing in the world, a particular machine or a particular process, and you're just tweaking something. So you're doing it, it's, it's innovative, so it's changing it, and it's, um, but it's not an invention as such. It's not the entire thing, it's just one part of a process. So that has a less um, arduous process for getting it registered, and but your protection only lasts for eight years. Again, two lots of four. So at the halfway point, you can pay, pay another fee. It's usually an easier process to go through and do that as part of it. Okay, so once you own the patent, you've created your thing, and again, I'm thinking pharmaceutical, so let's just say, on your Alfred, you've just invented the coronavirus vaccine. Okay, what does that mean? Um, means that you have this exclusive right for that term to exploit it. And much like copyright, you can assign it. New drugs usually get patent rights under WHO. Uh, New drugs usually do patent rights under WHO. I'm not sure I understand that question. New drugs usually do patent rights. Um, yeah, it's possible. Look, what happened in the 90s with drugs and drug companies is that poor countries couldn't afford what the expensive pharmaceutical companies were charging for things, particularly things like AIDS drugs, if there are things that stop, um, that retard HIV. And so they came up with an arrangement where you could have a low cost version of drugs or essentially the same drug um, for poor jurisdictions. Um, they just had to do this as part of the international copyright arrangements because it was just getting really silly. Um, a lot of people in Africa were just dying of HIV, which was you know, a lot of the time was preventable with expensive Western um, uh, pharmaceuticals. And so they came up with some arrangement in order to go through and do that because it's it really creates this two tier society on the planet, which isn't really good for anyone. Okay, uh, so like copyright, a patent, you can assign the patent to somebody else. You actually, as part of the registration, your name and information are stored there. That's stored forever and a day, so others can look up with that. But you can um, take your patent, your 
your intellectual right and you can license it again for people to use it in certain jurisdictions or for a certain length of time. Um, you can sell it or you can otherwise assign it again with, you know, you've got to do it in writing as part and parcel of that. Um, and much like copyright, um, when you are working for someone else by default, they own the copyright. Uh, sorry, they, they own that particular paint. Yeah, manual, yeah. So for COVID-19, if someone is going to find a medicine, it is like after nine years, it will become cheap. After 20, after 20 years. years. So it is, it won't come under innovation? No. No, because it's no. the invention is something that they'll look no, at as a whole. It's, it's not an existing product or a process where they're just changing one component of it. Um, but look, I mean, I mean, maybe that they're going to tweak an existing drug. Um, you know, if you took, oh, what's that stupid thing that the stupid American president's doing? Uh, the hydrochloroquine uh, guy's an idiot. Um, that he's taking that drug. Maybe you could take that and mix it with something else. You could make an argument that that's an innovative step. But look, to be honest, you probably wouldn't because you would want to get the the, the full extent if you were to go and register something that's obviously very, very, very valuable. Super, super valuable. Literally would be the most valuable thing on the planet if you want to go through and do that manual. That would be great. Everyone will be much, much obliged. Um, but just make note that employers usually own the patents of their employees, all right, by default. Um, that's University of w West Australia in grey. Um, there you've got an academic who was collecting a nice $150,000 salary and spent all of his time building some uh, medical stuff and then tried to argue that he owned it. And the UWA said, nah, -uh, and they went to court and he lost um, as part of that. He didn't lose on everything. He, lost, he won on some matters, but he, he didn't. Um, in terms of the pain, by default, your employer owns your the things that you invent. It's the fruits of your labor. It's the whole point of them you know, going and hiring you to go through and do stuff. This guy was trying to argue some sort of academic freedom thing and he, he didn't, didn't get up on it. All right, that's patents anyway. Um, and so yeah, watch this space. Very, very interesting in terms of whether how things are heading in the world in terms of this area. All right, next thing we look at is trademarks. Um, I like teaching this to business students because you guys just understand this. It's a lot more intuitive. Um, all right. A trademark is a sign, um, which can be a variety of different things, which we'll get to. Um, but it's used or intended to be used to distinguish goods and services. All right. And so that they are associated in some way uh, from or distinguishing your stuff from other people. So that when people, when customers see your particular sign, that they know that it's not all these other people, it's you, okay? And trademarks, you can go through and register those to stop other people from using your particular uh, trademark. And I think <laughs> when uh, when I was talking about uh, the tort of passing off, I think I might have mentioned that the color purple, um, how Cadbury owned the color purple, um, they went to go through and try, and try and trademark that. Yeah, a little bit strange, but they did actually get up. It's a little bit strange. All right, and so trademarks look really guys. It's about associating. Um, uh, it, the, the, trademarks are heavily related to brand. It's about differentiating, distinguishing. Yeah, exactly. Particular products with um, with things. So that if you look at uh, McDonald's, Apple, Coca Cola, yeah, you can think when you think of those particular products, you can think of certain signs that go with them. If I was so cavalier as to draw on the screen, this blip, blip, everyone would know, notwithstanding my terrible, terrible, terrible drawing, we'd probably be able to work out what particular type of product we associate that with, right? Sure. Coles and the Red Room, exactly. Um, however, what if we had this one? And I think I've, I think I think I talked about this when I talked about passing off. What about this one here? What product do you associate with that? Well, 
what product do people associate Wendy's with? I should put it as a poll. Maybe I'll do it as a poll. Uh, I'm gonna, oh, 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 oh. What product? Right. Really quite annoying. One thing that's come up a lot, by the way, um, is the, um, the uh, time spent typing up polls. There's no way of, pre of doing this in advance. Um, All right, let's go. I want to see what the result of this particular quiz is. Interesting. Okay, well, it's interesting. Um, yeah, I find it interesting being in Australia. If you ask this question in New Zealand, you get uh, the numbers would be reversed. Depends on which country. Yeah, yeah that's right. Um, although oddly, we actually have both. Um, Wendy's the ice cream place is a um, Australian brand, uh, but it, it operates in New Zealand and it operated before Wendy's the hamburger place arrived in the mid '90s. And so that that was interesting that they were actually able to coexist. I'm not sure, quite sure how, and they're both still there. Um, and so that again, if you ask that question in North America, you will definitely get hamburgers and not at all ice cream. In New Zealand, you, the numbers are probably reversed. Is the brand the same? Yeah, well, it's the same. Wendy's is quite a different brand. It's a completely different entity from Wendy's the burgers, is a different entity from Wendy's the ice cream. They're completely different people, different things. Because trademarks can actually exist in two different spheres. So when we think about the color purple, for example, if we're thinking about it in terms of Chocolate, which company is that? Cadbury. Yeah. When we think about it though, in, uh, and since they're not chocolate, we think about it in terms of, help me out here, fashionable people. Um, Emmanuel, are you a fashionable person? I'm thinking handbags. Handbags. Simon. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I have a doubt. For example, can I? Bring the same can can I bring up with the same Cadbury product with a different color product? With a uh, color. Uh, for example, yellow color cover. I'm not sure if I follow. Sure 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 can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear. Yeah, I'm I can hear. Color. For example, Coca Cola, they have a red and red, the particular color. So can I bring make the same Coca-Cola with different color? You could have cola with a different color. But if you brought, uh, first of all, if you use the name Coca-Cola, um, that name is going to be trademarked. So that's the first thing. So that's the first, the first, thing, thing, you're the first thing you're going to have. The second thing you're going to have is the color association because these two things can be different and distinct and both registered so that the coca-cola guys could register the swirly name coca-cola they can register that as a trademark but they could probably also in that particular domain of beverages register the color um, you know, was it red and white red white and black they might be able to get away with that maybe I'm not sure, I'd have to go and check. But you may know that that is not, it, when you ask for a trademark, in fact, oh, I've got my little registration here, have to be a second. I um, went and went to try and register a trademark. There's no way it's gonna succeed for a variety of reasons. But it was hilarious when I was dealing with the, uh, oh, it's a reminder. I, don't, I only have a reminder from the trademarks office. The lovely trademarks office, is it, does it not have your name on it? No, it doesn't. Um, turns out when I was going through and dealing with this, there were a whole bunch of defects on my um, uh, on my examination that the trademarks people do for a particular um, uh, business that I'd had a few years back. And 
the person dealing in the trademarks office was actually a former student, former JCU student who I studied with. And yeah, there were she missed a lot of things. There were there was no way it could have even been able to. It should never have got that far. Uh, there was a whole bunch of things that was missing. It was actually fundamentally incapable of being trademarked uh, because there's a bunch of other little rules. It it wasn't um uh, you you actually uh, supposedly you can't um trademark abbreviations apparently so just just an abbreviation isn't going to be sufficient to go through and do it it's not a sign as such um it has to actually be associated with something in the world just using a particular you can use a, a phrase uh, but abbreviations probably not going to be sufficient um which i discovered after doing some research later on but uh, she, yeah anyway so um, and so yeah, Coca-Cola, they would probably get up on a variety of, uh, of actions in regards to that one. Is JC or Trevor? No. Oh, my, I, no, I can't be. No. No, you're more than happy to create an entity and use the phrase JCU. Don't get me wrong. There are other areas of law that if you are doing something, you may be able to take that. So if you said that you're an education provider and you called yourself JCU, the tort of, of passing off might apply. But if JCU stands for um, just caring, uh, uh, I don't know, underground, I don't know, I can't think. There's three words that start with um, with those letters. Um, then it, it's not going to make a difference. In fact, if you type JCU, into Google from most places in the world, it comes up with John Carroll University anyway. Um, so it's only in Queensland, when you've got a Queensland IP, that it comes to the local uh, abbreviation of that anyway. Okay, all right, so just make a note, those are three elements. Um, so it has to be signed, it has to relate to goods and services, and it has to differentiate them from others. So it's not about um, associating things with yours, it's about just making it your particular thing different from all of the other things. And this is a really interesting one. Signs can include words, letters, names, sure. Signatures, devices, headings, shapes, sure. Colors, yeah, color purple, sound, or scent. So, um, so if I can see, I'm not gonna be able to play any later, but certainly the noise that the Apple Mac makes when you turn it on. They used to go, that's trademarkable. You could actually get a trademark for that particular noise. And if others tried to have a computer that made that same noise and your trademark was registered, you'd be able to um, to bring an action under the act. You don't actually have to register, uh, but you can go through and register under the Trademarks Act. Stops others from jumping the boat and registering it on top of you. Um, but scent is an interesting one. Um, certain types of perfume. You can literally register a certain type of smell and trademark it. No kidding. I actually don't know the mechanism for doing this. You'd presumably have to get some sort of smelling expert. Maybe there's a career path for me somewhere. Um, and they would have to go through and put in an affidavit. This is um, this particular smell is associated with this particular product. Um, I used to, oh, years ago when I cared about cars, I used to buy very, very expensive car wax, car wax, complete car wax care products. And one of the interesting things about it, though, is that aside from being outrageously expensive, um, it was called uh, Mother's Car Wax and Car Wash stuff. And it was called Mother's, and it was supposed to be this American brand, supposed to be like Mars Apple Pie. And curiously, they had made this particular car wax smell like apple pie. And I thought, well, that's really clever. That's just a really clever idea. Um, but the scent part usually comes up for um, expensive perfumes, the Jean Paul Gaultier and, um, and Gucci and JP, uh, Toshi Gabbana and things like that, where they're able to differentiate their particular product from others through doing it. So you can actually trademark that. There we go. Okay, uh, what have we got? We've got, uh, okay. First things first, in order to be able to use the trademarks legislation, you have to actually use the particular uh, thing. You actually, in order to get it trademarked, you have to actually use it. Um, so that, that uh, in order to register it, um, the stuff has to be used. Um, and that's the first thing. So you can go through and do that. Um, secondly, it has to actually differentiate um, your particular products or services. It can't, um, 
it, you can't get a trademark if a whole bunch of people are doing the same thing. Um, if the color purple was used by a whole bunch of people at the point in time you're going and trying to register it. Um, you can put the little TM. So there we go, from this point forward. When you ever see the little TM, all right, a trademark doesn't need to be registered. Okay? You don't need to register a trademark, but you aren't, you're not going to be able to use the, the, provisions, the provisions under the Act and another person can come along and register it. If you are registered under the Act, if, for whatever reason, the um, idiots at the, at the trademarks office manage to go through and register your particular trademark, you can then rock up with your little piece of paper and so get other people to stop using it, okay? Even if they've been using it for a long time. Um, so is there a difference? Uh, there is a small R as well on the top of the logo and I've seen TM as well. Is there a difference? The difference is unregistered trademarks use TM. Registered trademarks are allowed to use the R. You can always use a TM. From this point forward, there's a piece of information for all of you guys, when you're going and starting your businesses, you can absolutely, when you start your business, use a little TM. However, if you start just putting the TM on something and somebody comes along and it's exactly the same as somebody else's, even if you weren't aware of it, they may be able to sue you under the tort of passing off. Um, if there's neither yours nor theirs is registered. If you start using a TM and somebody's already got a registered one that looks exactly the same, um, you're going to be in trouble because under the statute, you've infringed it. So that you are just straight up going to be infringing the um, uh, the trademark in that particular so situation. you to say that if I put TM, but it's actually registered, that's why it's going to sue me? Well, if somebody has a registered trademark and you are using a sign, smell, scent, logo that looks the same as theirs, they're going to be able to sue you regardless of whether you put a TM or not. All you're doing by putting the TM is holding out to the world that this is my trademark. I'm just telling the world, oh, this is my trademark. And so by doing that, um, first things first, if others want to go and enter into competition with you and they see that, that trademark's already there. You've got the little TM thing. You're demonstrating that this particular brand or logo or center is associated with some products or services. You can go through and do that to tell the world that I have an unregistered trademark on this particular thing. You can do that now. The only risk that you have is that by doing that and holding that out to the world, if somebody else already has a registered trademark, theirs is going to trump yours and their going to come and they can usually they can seek an injunction to ask you to stop using it. Um, that's really the, the key thing there. Um, that's part and parcel. I mean, what about a scenario like you have a trademark, I have a trademark, both are not registered. Mm -hmm. uh, how will you prove that I took yours? That's the, the rules of evidence. That's a question of evidence. I would we have to. Sue. That person can sue if both have. You can, both, you can sue each other. It's, okay. it's not uncommon here. You know what you've actually said. That situation where you've got two companies ostensibly doing the same thing and trying to sue each other off. Remember that each side has to prove um, under the tort of passing off, which is what we did under the torts lecture, that um, the other side are using something or leveraging off the the goodwill of your company. You have to prove that they are leveraging off your goodwill and that customers are misled to think that their products are your products. You've got to prove that. You've got to go get gather the evidence yourself. And the other side, if they're both unregistered, they may be gathering evidence, evidence against you to go through and argue that you've got the particular product and others are confused about what you're doing. And this can happen where you've got two geographical locations um, such as the, I mean, it was done under the statute, but the example was the um, uh, the Taco Bell cases that were used. It was done under the, the Trade Practice Act. It was under done under statute. But the equivalent thing is that sometimes one lot of customers might be misled to thinking the others were their particular um, were their particular goods and services. And so usually you can have a first in time. 
but you may have geographic locations. These guys might be first in New South Wales, but only in one little pocket of New South Wales. And these other guys might have started in Queensland, then gone to all of the other states and territories. The example that I used for passing off was the Cock and Bull Tavern in Cairns. I was walking through the back streets of Cairns and I found this pub with the Cock and Bull written all over it. I'm like, oh wow, there's a Cock and Bull Tavern. I can't believe it. Because in New Zealand, all across New Zealand, um, from 1995 through to about 2010, the Cock and Bull was a big deal. It was a big pub. And they had pubs everywhere. Um, called that when they brewed their own beer. It was amazing. And so I was very disappointed to go to this old, crusty pub in the middle of Cairns. I was very disappointed. Um, I walked into that pub because I thought it was different to what it was. So I was misled. The question is, um, do these things operate in two different geographical locations? So in other words, I was a customer. I was misled. Um, but I, well, I don't even think they operated in Australia, so it may not have mattered. But assuming that they operated in Sydney, which I think they did, um, in theory, if the guys in Sydney were to bring an action against the guys in Cairns, in theory, they could take my testimony to say I was one of those customers and I was misled, in theory. But it's a, it's a question of evidence. You've got to prove these things. Um, it's kind of outside the scope of, of this, this subject, really. Okay, and yeah, and I'd mentioned the tort of passing off. We actually did it for tort. So that if you, neither side is registered, you can both make an argument. But you've got to prove these things to the other side. The, the moral of the story is, by the way, if you think this is going to be a problem, what should you do? You should go and try and register your trademark. Because once you've got a registered trademark, you can then, and you pay a fee, it's about $500. Um, you can get a bunch of rights under the statute. You can stop um, goods that infringe your trademark from being imported. If others are using your trademark, you can seek damages or you can get an account of profits or you can, again, you can seek an injunction to stop them from using it. Um, it's also a piece of intangible property that you can assign. You can sell it, that trademark, to someone else. Um, and uh, they last for 10 years by default and you can pay I think it's the same fee every year, uh, $500 to, um, to re-register your trademark as part of that. Um, that, that's all I really have to say about trademarks. I'm going to wait for time. Oh, I might be finished a little early. Oh, Ravne, yes. So um, if I have a registered trademark yep. and someone does, um, like he uses the trademark with the same logo or something like that. So yep. the office people who issue the trademark hmm. they have to check everything right so this is yes. already registered so we don't have to yep. give the, right yep it takes about six months it takes ages oh, okay yeah so they do so once they do if again if they're happy with that and they've gone and checked everywhere they literally do a few Google searches and they look around they check the company's office they check the, the business names thing and they check all sorts of things one if they're happy with it they grant you the trademark and then that's fine. From that point on, it's your piece of intellectual property. You can do what you like with it. You can sell it. You can stop other people from using it. Um, sometimes uh, you can use these things. Uh, yeah, I won't delve too much into my own situation, but um, yeah, there's a whole variety of things that you can go through and do and use it. Uh, they're up there. Uh, but the, the key thing there is that look, if others are using it, you can ask them to pay you some sum of money, even if after the fact. Um, so that is why be really careful to make sure you go and check these things because if you're operating uh, a business and you're starting up a new business, make sure you go and thoroughly check these things. If you do want to have a particular brand and you think it's worthwhile spending the $500 on, go through and register the trademark because they'll go through and do those checks. You, only one person can hold a particular trademark at any given moment in time. Um, so that's it's definitely worth going through and doing if you are setting up a new business. Also, when you're setting it and thinking about business names, the name you choose um, is important. Uh, I don't think I think within the undergraduate subject, I think oh, long after you did that, uh, Cortano, but the undergraduate business law subject, JCU, we, we have a module where we talk about setting up a business. Um, one of the things to note is with business names, you ideally your the business name you you pick should be unique and special so that you can get trademarks relating to that name and you can get urls.com urls relating to that name as well that's why you want to come up with um, a portmanteau of, of, of a couple of names together in order to um, to make that work okay 
I will move on to the very final slide, which is confidential information. All right. So going back to that uh, <laughs> Coca-Cola, the recipe of Coca-Cola is a trade secret. It's not, um, it is, was not publicly released. Now, confidential information is, I suppose, is a little different from trade secrets in that it is protected by law, all right, but it's actually, um, it's actually governed by the rules of equity because information that's imparted in confidence that is then misused is an affront to good conscience for people to go through and do that. It's actually not a statutory regime, okay? So um, if people do go through and and here, the main time where this comes up is actually with employees. Employees going and taking information from companies, particularly things like customer lists, where or a business strategy, things that are, uh, are produced in the process of business, um, which is a pretty important thing for you guys. Again, doing an MBA or an MPA, stuff that's produced as part of and parcel of being in business that is imparted to you in circumstances of confidence. All right. If that happens, there are rules in common law, but largely in equity, that will allow the other side, the person whose information that you're pinching or that you're imparting elsewhere when you weren't supposed to, to seek remedies against you. Um, that they can seek, um, they can actually seek injunctions preventing you from going and doing things. Usually they will seek uh, uh, damages or account of profits. If you've gone, taken um, confidential information and misused it in some way. Um, they can try and seek an account of profits if you're making profits from that information. Um, or they can seek an injunction to prevent you from doing or using it in some way. Uh, so that, um, and again, the, the classic situation is customer lists where you're an employee and you work for a company and you know the business strategy of that company and you also know who the customers are. Being able to, the day you leave, send an email to all of those customers, that is worth something. And by default, as an employee, you have a duty to your employer and that duty survives the employee-employer relationship. All right, so even when you stop getting paid, that confidential information carries on. You can't quit your job, then the next day, send an email to all of your former employer's uh, customers saying, hey, you want to go to this new entity? You cannot do that. That information is imparted to you in confidence, in a fiduciary relationship. You owe a duty to a fiduciary, a very high duty to your employer to not do that. And if you do do that, you can be held accountable. And you guys may remember that case when we talk about breach of trust of Yu Yang. Do you remember Yu Yang? You probably want to remember it because I'm probably going to put it in your uh, take home test. There's a heads up. Um, because in Yu Yang, remember that was when they, they were spending uh, $250,000 to, to obtain a $500,000 bond in 10 years' time. The idea that the face value was $50,000 and there were the two classifications, um, the capital protected and the non-capital protected, and they mistakenly chose the wrong one and all the money was lost, right? All the money was lost in both situations. There the court said, we don't care. This is a fiduciary relationship. You are held to an outrageously high standard. The one I couldn't digest. Henna, I haven't managed to digest it either. The, uh, the only takeaway is that with breaches of trust and breaches of fiduciary duty, the courts will hold you to an incredibly high standard. That's the real takeaway from that. And sometimes the common sense test of causation the rules don't apply. They will hold you to put your the person who trusted you, um, the person who you owed the fiduciary relationship, to put you in a position um, to put them back not just to where they were, but where they ought to have been. And when I say ought to have been, that defines all of the rules of other rules of causation and common sense and the but for test. Put you where, where they ought to have been was to have that five hundred thousand dollars. Seems crazy because they wouldn't have got it because the investment went sour. That's the level of standard that you're held accountable to, um, and that's why these idea of fiduciary duties 
These are things you can't bypass. Um, it's a difficult area of law to sort of teach to you guys, again, particularly from those that are coming from different education system and different um, sort of legal systems. When you're here, if you breach these duties, you, you're done and done way more than you think you're going to get done. People think, oh, if I just do a little bit of this, oh, yeah, I'm going to have to pay a little bit of money. No. No, if you're going to make a profit from something, all of the profit will go to the person you owe the fiduciary duty to. Um, all of the property that you have can be vested in the other. Um, even if you've tried to give it away to family or friends, courts don't care. In equity, they don't care. Um, if those people have knowingly assisted with a breach, they don't care. They will just vest it to the um, what they come in Singapore. Well, that's that's one way of doing it. That put it outside the jurisdiction. Yes, yes, that's fine. But um, tricky because if the company is in, don't keep money in Australia. That's right. Yep, that's right. What's the problem with that though? If you, you know, with anything, I mean, oh, come on, let's face it. We've all been working for places. I work for a major bank in Australia. When you're sitting there, I'm always sitting there thinking, if I was to rob this place, what would I have to do? I mean, I was working for the custodian, so they had, by rob, I mean, they had literally, I don't know, $200 billion worth of money under custody, um, sitting on a portable hard drive on my desk. Um, Awkward. Um, you know, what would I have to do? Well, I could steal all this money, but then I'd have to go and live in Brazil. Can't see your family, can't see your friends, don't get all the benefits of living in a country with administrative law and a free press. Exactly. With all that money, you can live even in the moon, I can guarantee you. <laughs> and again, it goes back to that point I made a little earlier. This is the last slide, so I'm going to go back to my point is that. When you've come and you've lived in these sorts of places for a long time, there's a certain point that the money aspect becomes less and less important to people. I, I swear, I, I know, I know this is going to sound like, like crazy talk, um, but it really genuinely does. It genuinely, genuinely does. It's all about, yeah, Rachel. Rachel? Nope, nope, can't hear you. I'm going to lower the hand. Um, there is a certain point where it ceases to, to really have much. It's important for those exactly. Sorry, money is important for those who don't. Who, if you don't, it's about maintaining and reaching a certain standard. And again, this is a piece of business philosophy. Maybe it's staging. <laughs> yeah, nice one, Marie. <laughs> We're getting, back when I had hair, I cared all about the money. Um, and there's a certain point where it, it ceases to um, it ceases to really be that motivating. Yes, Dan's. No, can't hear. People are putting their hands up, putting their hands up in the little thing. But I can't. Um, trust me, every country is good to live if you have money. Yeah, it is. But some countries are better to live in when you don't have money than others. So being poor in Australia, if you are, say, in the, um, when does my husband get a hair transplant? <laughs> like, oh, I like it. Again, I've stopped caring about hair. Um, the, um, it's a really about what your bottom 10%. Poor country is better if you have money. Yes, that's right. So again, uh, and this is actually an interesting point because it's, um, funnily enough, actually going back to the TRIPS agreement, this is one of the difficulties that they've had with uh, countries and the um, the way that copyright, uh, sorry, patents work with things like drugs. Um, is Brazil a poor country? Uh, is India a poor country? I think, well, it's all about the percentage of, of people because some countries are poor, but there's not much difference between rich and poor. Okay, some countries, and again, we're thinking of Eastern European countries, where, you know, um, this is a, well, maybe it's not so much these days, but um, the, the gap between rich and poor isn't very much. The former socialist countries, but the, you know, the bottom poor aren't particularly worse. The, the bottom people aren't you know, particularly bad off by world standards. Okay, whereas you look at other countries with vast polarizations of wealth, Brazil being the classic example, where if you're in the top 10% of Brazilians, it's a wonderful place to live. If you're in the bottom 
80%, it's a god-awful place to live. That's problematic because that's the way Brazil, Brazilian culture and government and society choose to organize things. That's essentially the way the country is structured. So the question is, should um, uh, drugs, for example, be given to Brazil as opposed to well, maybe South Africa is another example where you've got the way that country is or perhaps was structured, um, where you've got a wealthy elite and you know, 40 million poor people. Um, if that's the way the country does, should that country be able to receive, um, you know, generic drugs from 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 uh, you know, developed nations? Um, and that's that's a difficult question. It's a question for political scientists and, and politicians, and, and possibly not for us. But uh, but certainly, this is a wealthy country. Being in the bottom 10% in Australia is vastly better than being. Uh, you know the median level of wealth in most countries in the world. But again, being in the bottom 10%, so being at the, at the, we'll say the, in the, well, let's say you're the 10% that you're the, the top of the 10% in Australia, um, is vastly better off than being in the, you know, the 60% mark in many countries in the world, many, many, many countries. Um, because it has a welfare system, um, uh, it has a minimum wage instruction system. Where I think at the moment, I think if you are um, with the yeah, it is, and that's right, and that has flow-on effects. That there, as a result, the, the population by and large is much more educated on average. They just are. They just they just are. When you're going and you're dealing with people, um, the general public, there's more education because there's more access to it because it's funded. Um, the tertiary study is funded as part and parcel of that. Um, you don't have people, no, not funded for internationals. Can I, no, no, it's not the fact it's not funded. When you said there is more education, that's I don't agree. Um, the percentage of people with tertiary degrees in Australia sits at about between 30 and 35 percent. I know, but the fact is, how easy is how easy is it to get the tertiary degrees? Because, for example, get a degree here, it's much, much, much more easier to get a degree in Italy, in Spain. Oh, it is. Absolutely. And that's, that's you know, to this. and then another thing, when you said poor money, you have to check the other side of the medal. Check, for example, the mental illness here in Australia. How the structure, you know what I mean? There is the <laughs> good part and the bad part, too. How the, how the society is structured. Yeah. Um, mental illness is an interesting one because it didn't exist when I was a kid. It wasn't mental illness, or rather, there was mental illness. It just didn't have a name, so it didn't have funding as part and parcel of that. And so you'd have, again, it's really about the the overall well-being of people in in this country, and that has flow-on effects because you get other advantages, the ability to travel. Again, if you go and you earn literally a minimum wage job in Australia full time for three years, um, and you're you know, reasonably good at at saving. Um, you can travel the world. You can go through and do that, and, and because the currency is valuable, uh, the currency is valuable for a variety of things. The country has resources, and people want to live here. Net migration is part and parcel of that. And again, I'm, yeah, I'm confident that a non-zero fraction of people in this class um, are, you know, seeking to have a pathway in order to migrate to Australia. Um, it has a huge amount of economic benefits trying to explain to Australians, Australian citizenship is a very valuable thing. It is just, it, you can put an economic value on it. You know, it's hundreds of thousands of dollars um, because if you were to go elsewhere in the world, you have to pay for your health care. Um, in Australia, if you're an Australian citizen, if you get injured or you get sick, there is a public health care system. You can go to the Townsville Hospital. You can walk in there. I'm going to just explain something. I'm a Kiwi, and you guys may think that New Zealanders and Australians are the same. Oh, no, 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 no. Um, I'm a tail end Gen Xer. So when I went, uh, I had uh, chopped my cornea open. I'm going to tell you the story. Um, I went to, was going to go to the specialist, and you know, I had to go through and organize this, and they said, oh, there's going to be a bit of a wait. Why don't you go to the public hospital? I'm like, oh, oh, okay. Is that a thing? Right. So I walked to the public hospital. 
and I sat there, waited for 45 minutes, and then somebody came and took me out, put some stuff in my eyes, did this, and then put in the things, and did these tests, and then some, somebody else left, and somebody else came in, and somebody else did this other thing, and so I spent there for an hour or so going through having all these tests, and they walked me out to the, um, the waiting room, um, and they said, oh, if you have any other problems, you know, come back and see us in a week's time, and they walked off, okay? And I stood there like an idiot, waiting. I, I stood there waiting for about four minutes, I stood there waiting for somebody to walk up to me and say, oh, and here's your invoice for the work we did today. It didn't even occur to me that this was free. Oh, is it really? I didn't realize that, Nathan. Oh, there we go. For education and healthcare in Sudanka. That's good. Is, I, does it get taken up? Is that tertiary education? Uh, no, up to bachelor's, they're giving free education. Up to bachelor's. Up, up to bachelor's. Okay, so there's the tertiary. The tertiary. Oh, there you go. I didn't know that. Certainly in some countries. I'm Norway. You can, if you guys want to go to Norway, they will pay you. It's remarkable. Uh, same back in Sri Lanka. Well, we think they're paying for us. Like, I think it's free in Sweden as well. Yeah, yeah, the Scandinavian, the Scandinavian countries have that too, and in Holland. Yep, have it too. So here, um, Australia has sort of got a hybrid system where you, um, the domestic students have a loan system uh, and so Kiwis we sort of always fell between halfway so we I had to pay cash but I paid at the domestic rate which is about half the international rate um, here um, but it's none nonetheless um, I'm not sure what the Australians thoughts are on the on the student loan system here um, I think it's hilarious um, the way it works I don't know if you're aware how the repayment system works but that's that's more for those that are doing tax law next year ask Van or whoever takes tax next year about it don't look at mine yeah it's a thing um, but Nathan yeah yeah this is there you just don't get me wrong if, if I was an international student in fact anybody that would come here would much rather have put things on a loan rather than have to pay it um, the Americans have a system where they have private they have private entities that do their student loans. So they, um, North America, they have, well, the United States, I'm thinking, they have those systems where you have to take out private loans, not public, publicly funded loans like the ones here. If you die, your student loan dissolves. At least I think it does in Australia. I think it still does. Um, and you don't have to have worry about that debt being transferred and others having to, um, to fund things out of that. And it's indexed at the CPI. And except the CPI. Oh, is the CPI actually Marie or Gatana? Gatana, you might know. Is it still the CPI? It's indexed at. It might might have registered the nine day bank bill. I'm not sure. But either way, student my student loan in the 90s was 9.5 percent per annum. So yeah, interest rates are a bit higher in New Zealand. Tax is terrible. Tax is not terrible. Tax is absolutely essential for the good governance of society. The tax and the paying of tax by all citizens is something that people do and they do it out of habit. That is one of the very, very important things. The way you're using, well, the paying of tax and how governments choose to go and use it is, um, they're two completely different things. Completely, completely different things. That's that's um, how the government uses it. That's a political question. If you don't like the way the government is spending your tax dollars, you know what you should do? You should. Vote them out. Now, what's the problem? Until you get citizenship, you don't even get to vote. It's a little bit unfair, isn't it? They are all the same, trust me. Left, right. Awesome. Same. Uh, don't you be surprised. I went to see our local senator about the rights of New Zealanders in Australia, and two weeks later, they had a, um, a meeting between the um, between the Prime Minister then, which was Malcolm Turnbull then, and uh, the Prime Minister, which was John Key in New Zealand, and they changed the rules. Um, largely because the guy was the chair of the select committee and it, him and his little lackey were just completely wrong about what was about to happen, which was um, Kiwis who were born, uh, two New Zealanders that arrived in uh, Australia after 2001, if they had kids here, those kids couldn't get hex. So they changed the rules to accommodate for that. Yeah, and you should. Just if you, you, know, you can walk down the street and it's regulated. Um, I've said this to my friend the other day. When you cross, and again, I live in um, I live in Douglas and Riverside Gardens. So if you walk down Riverside Boulevard, which I recommend to do if you get the chance, um, oh, I come there a lot. Good, it's lovely, and you can walk through these paths. They're all there. They're clean. They're managed. When you cross the road, 
you're probably not going to get run over. And most importantly, you don't have to think about it. You don't have to actually go through the thought process when you're going through and doing these things. And it's important because it means that all of the mental energy you have to use to survive in countries with less regulation, all the, those thought processes, you don't have to go through and do. So you can spend that mental energy doing other things, creating things, things for fun or things for work to add and create new value in the world. Um, and that's something I think is a really, really valuable part. We just, yeah, road suggestions. Yeah, yeah, traffic lights are just suggestions on, uh, on, the, on the streets of uh, streets of Mumbai, eh? Yeah, Abhishek. Road suggestions. Um, Trevor Noah is a South African comedian, and he, he has a good thing about that. If you Google him, he talks about that a bit. Um, but there is this aspect. Yeah, he's great. He's real good. There is this aspect, though, that um, when you're here, there are some really good things. Don't get me wrong. There are some bad things. I, I think there are some terrible things that, from where I come from, I don't think they do very well here. I think there's too much money in politics here. I think your preference system, um, it, being, it being hidden, is problematic. I think that uh, there are some pressure groups that have poss arguably more power than they do elsewhere. Um, the miners, yeah, your miners, your banks, the Catholic Church, and the unions have so much more power in this country than they do in New Zealand. Just so much more visibility. It's, uh, it's amazing. But you do do some things much better than they do over there. Um, I said New Zealand's got no capital gains tax, which is st the stupidest of stupid things. And so that wealth polarization has happened a lot faster in the last 30 odd years. Um, Australia has a constitution, actually has a formal written constitution. Um, most of us don't know what's in it. Um, go look up the uh, comedian, Australian comedian guy called Jim Jeffries. If you don't mind a little bit of the language, he has a very good uh, skit on um, uh, gun control. Jim Jeffries gun control. Have a listen to that. It's, it's very entertaining. Um, but, you know, and the existence of states. You guys are probably aware that the states, the Queensland government loses money hand over fist. Absolutely terribly run institution. Goes to the federal government with a begging bowl asking for more money um, because it can't, it literally couldn't survive if it wasn't for the federal government and the GST. And oddly, Australians hated the GST. They hated it. They rallied against it. Oh, it's the worst thing ever. Um, it was political suicide for many, many, many years. It was amazing how it even got in. Six attempts goes, yeah, it is. The standards are high. Um, I, a lot of my Kiwi friends, and I'm not exaggerating, would fail if they had to come here and do a test. Um, yeah, yeah, she's, um, yeah, she does, but all right. She's younger than me. It's one thing, there's a certain moment where, you know, when, it's one thing when sports stars are younger than you. Uh, Dan Vittori, yeah, I'm a Kiwi, so Dan Vittori was younger than me. And I was like, oh, no, I'm never going to play cricket for New Zealand. Um, and now um, the heads of state are younger than me. I'm like, oh, my God. Um, Emmanuel Macron, the French president, he's younger than me. Um, it's just like, ah, oh, shaking my head. Why don't you like her, Rika? I'd love to see him play. Ah, oh, yeah, he wore glasses. He wore glasses playing cricket. Nah. I don't know. She's too much. Um, she, I think she lives in a world that is not the contemporary one. You know what I mean? It's like I just read that she want to put four hour, uh, four days uh, work week. I mean, it's something with no sense. Oh, the four day work week is because of the COVID though. That's, yeah, um, yeah. But even, uh, you know, I mean... That's smart. A, no, that's, that's a really good policy. Yeah, that's that's know, really, really good. Research has proved that four days works better. Um, yeah, the Germans tried it a while ago. I think uh, Volkswagen tried. Uh, tried Sweden, Sweden yeah. on, is on uh, shorter days now, yeah. officially, and it's much more efficient. Yeah, it is. And look, if you think about it, um, if you were to work longer on the days where you were doing, this is the trouble, this is the pervasiveness of work um, work life and home life. At the moment, we're all at home. We're all doing all of our work and doing all of our study at home. And so you've got this this pervasiveness that forms part of it. And it's one thing I, I do appreciate in terms of, you know, the trade unions over the last you know, 150 years have pushed towards trying to remove those things. Um, however, the flip side of that is something they don't do very well in Australia, which is entrepreneurship. Um, there was, there's just nothing in this country about 
new venture creation and innovation and going it on your own. It's all about jobs, the culture, the language is all about jobs. That's that's a little bit different across the Tasman. We, um, the, you still have this idea. In fact, even here, people don't talk about um, entrepreneurship. They say self-employment. So it still comes back to this idea of jobs. Job, 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 jobs. Not who's creating jobs, who's creating employment, who's hiring other people. The, that's that's not something that forms part of your education system. It's not, and it's increasingly less so. The universities are making us talk about jobs everything about this and employment, not about entrepreneurship and value creation. It's the problem why China's buying everything. Yeah, I did have a chat with somebody about this. And it, well, okay, it was an internet flame war, but leaving that aside, um, people said, oh, why don't we just nationalize the um, uh, the port? You know, the Chinese port we've got a lease for the port of Darwin for 99 years. Why don't we just nationalize? Just take it back. So, well, one of the reason why you can invest in Australia is that Australia has a constitutional um, per, uh, clause that says you can't just take someone's stuff without compensating them. Um, it's a constitutional restriction. And what you're finding in countries, and those countries include South Africa, China, and Russia, all three of them in the last few years just changed their constitution. That's a really, really bad thing for the, the government of the day to be able to just arbitrarily change the constitution. Why? Because you're not providing any checks and balances on. They're allowed to do whatever they like. Here, no, sorry, no, because uh, when, uh, for example, in Italy, you you have two chambers. Nowadays, everything is going faster. You can't wait the thousand parliamentaries they get, you know, they get their head out of some law. If everything has to be quick, to change your basic law, to change no. the constitution. It's like Law. It's like here in Australia. You have one chamber, you have the other, uh, the other one. Mm -hmm. Everything like this uh, has been uh, like created hundreds years ago when the community, the societies, was like much, much slower. Now, when you have to decide a law, you have to be, you know I mean, uh, quick, uh, less people that argue. You know what I mean? For how everything's go. Like yeah. you said, Russia. For example, Russia changing a few things the constitution. I read the word they change. Yeah, they they let Putin stay in power uh, indefinitely. No, they just uh, change from four to six years, uh, and they change a few things uh, in how everything works. In Italy, they are 30 years trying to change the constitution, and they can't. For that reason, it's a mess. Because everything, everyone was balanced the power, but when you try to stop the other one, no one can move, and no one make any law properly. That is the this problem. Is, this is true, but... At the end of the day, do you want for power to be concentrated in one entity? And if I'm thinking of an entity, it's the Communist Party of China. Do you want power to be concentrated and have no checks and balances on it? Okay, That's the problem. Depend how the country works. If you bring the Australian democracy, you bring to China. China will be broke in ten days. They say oh. if you bring the Australia. Yeah. You know, the Australian things uh, in India or, or in uh, other countries uh, out the, where, where the mentality is different, uh, they'll be gone. In Middle East, uh, the same. If you bring uh, this type of democracy there, uh, uh, the population is not ready. Because right. yeah, I do agree no, with I that. Agree. I agree. Yeah. Um, that. In Iraq, Iraq was a classic example of this. Um, the yeah. democratic tradition. Iraq, takes, Libya, uh, Libya, Iraq, yeah. Libya, it takes, Syria, time. It takes time. But where did it work? Germany and Japan. It took time. It did take time to go through and to do that. And that is absolutely true. And that's why Iraq, the, the erasion of Iraq in Tuesday was such a total disaster because they didn't think it through. Um, and it's something that if you... It's better now, like it was 20 years ago. It, uh, yeah, apparently it is, but it, it's that um, something. It was always going to take a really, really long time. A generation um, was going to take. You know what I mean? You can't push because if you push, it's like Afghanistan. Yeah. They're 20 years. They're just wasting time and money. Yeah. They will never no, Yeah. There's no. The other thing to note, though, Iraq is different from Afghanistan because there is there is actually natural resources. Um, that ability to you can founder your economy. Political games. 
But if you see democracy, check US. No, US, you see the bigger democracy. You have Clintons, they are 30 years in power. You have the deep state, they're like little dicks. Huh? You know, Clinton what? fame. How many years is in power? Clinton, I mean, nice. Clinton, they have the end of uh, all these things. They are 30 years there. You check the, you check the senators, they are all the same. Oh, That's senators, cool. yeah, sure. But the, um, but your president changes and your executive changes. Yeah, it's, a, it's a map in the US because it's all the deep state, they work everything, you know. Uh, Just try to move everything. Yeah, maybe. I, I think you, it's, um, start with, start with constitutions that are difficult to change. The people can still change it, but it shouldn't be the party. One government shouldn't be able to change the constitution um and the people shouldn't shouldn't accept it that's that's really the part and parcel of that that's really yeah, the, um, key thing. if the government is, is voted it's like you said i don't like putin okay but if russian they vote putin what you can do <laughs> well i don't know whether they can vote him out i think his his uh the opposition uh leader don't they get killed occasionally i don't i, I haven't paid attention no, this time. it's different because for example i don't know have you been to middle east no, no, I haven't. I'm sure much. Okay. Do you okay? Do you see any crimes? Do you see any drugs? I can't answer that. I haven't been there. Uh, no, the same in Russia. Oh, sorry, am I am I saying that are there crimes that happen in the Middle East? Um, Tala. No. <laughs> I'm talking like Bob. We <laughs> are the proud nation of honor <laughs> crimes. If you'd like to know, oh. where you can shoot your sister. Because she's not a virgin and not go yeah, to jail. I'm talking, about, <laughs> I'm talking about like drugs, things like that. You know? I will I will take you for a drive to the Bika Valley where we grow them. <laughs> it's they say it's like Russia. You go in Russia, I don't know, in some cities, they you see everything is clean, perfect. Why? Because if someone make a mistake, they kill him. I feel that's the thing. Yeah. Um. Coming back full circle to here, um, it's not perfect. And there's this thing. And so what we find is that in institutions, again, where you have a, a functioning, arguably functioning legal system with uh, the ability for the legal profession, one thing we find is that it's, it's kind of our jobs as like legal academic types to, um, to go through, examine laws and regulations that exist and come up and offer suggestions, which usually just get ignored by governments of the day, or at least the, um, the main policy things. But you find that there's a lot of behind the scenes stuff where trying to go through and map and change laws requires a lot of small detail that forms part and parcel of that. There's a lot of actors in that as part of that process. Um, and note that a lot, you know, the vast bulk of lawmaking is done through delegated legislation so that it's local councils, um, for example, that go through and do things and create rules and laws and do the regulation of the day-to-day -day stuff that we have. And again, that's still funded. Um, pay our, our rates bills due. Oh, when's it due? In a couple of months. Um, it's funded because people are, you know, by and large, are willing to pay taxes. And the reason that people are paying taxes is because they can't avoid paying tax because you have the GST and your PAYG and your company tax. They're difficult things to evade um, as part of that. And so that, that aspect of regulation um, is an important part of that process as well. But it's really hard. You can't just build it up as they discover that it was why Iraq was problematic. You can't just flick a switch. Okay, we're just going to do this and put it in the system and do this. And it's like, no, people just it takes time. And said Germany and Japan, which are now you know the, these you know, bastion nation states of functioning democracy, is um, that are also economic powerhouses. Um, but that took a couple of generations for that to happen. Um, and so that's again, there's, there is hope in the world, um, but it is not in letting people, parties, do whatever they like, um, regardless of how good it is for their people. And if you believe anything about the Belt and Road, <laughs> um, yeah, it's a scary, scary thought. Scary thought. Anyway, I probably should have ended up there anyway. Well, we. Uh, before someone yeah, finds we are out, we're having again. a very good discussion. But let's move okay. to three. Let's go. So we're going to go. I'm going to end that there, guys. So I'm going to quickly talk about your assessment.
quickly, quickly talk about that, um, which is going to be released, I think it's tomorrow at five o'clock, and it's due at midnight on Sunday. Um, it's going to take a, it will take a couple of hours work. Um, all right. It's not actually that taxing. I said it's 200, um, three lots of 200 words. Some of them are just short sentences. Sometimes you're going to have to read it. You can have to do some research. I put in the in the chat earlier um, the stuff on agency because I think it's underdone in both the textbook and in the lecture slides. But by and large, it's from the slides. If you don't understand what the slides are meaning, you'll have to go back and listen to the recordings until you've really got and understood that. It's, um, it's a series of, of sort of practical tasks. It's less theoretical than some of the previous ones. Um, what that means, though, is that for most of them, there's a right answer and a wrong answer. Um, you're not really going to be able to bluff, um, sadly. It's going to be, um, and so they're, they're based in little things um, broken up. The agency question's five marks. Uh, the trust one will probably be five marks as well. The others are broken up into small little snippets. So you want to give everything a go, even if you're not 100% sure on it, because you can still get sort of half marks from a good explanation. Fine, nope. In the yeah. earlier exam, um, you said something um, which helped a lot, which is that the questions are not meant to trick us in any way. No. So I want to just check that this applies to this. So I don't want to, you know, I don't want to start thinking that oh, maybe he means this, maybe he means that. Do we take it at face value? Is it meant for us just to test our knowledge, or is there like a trick to it? Definitely face value for this piece of assessment. This, this is a face value piece of assessment um, for the ones where you have to go and do some research. I've literally put for the agency one a link for you to guys to go through and use the database if you do have a difficulty with that. If uh, you can Simon, be able I to, to, sorry, I had to sign in again. So the you, you 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 just put a link in the chat. Can you please put that again because the chat. Oh is yeah, sure. Gone. Yeah, sure thing. Um, I'll just take it. It's from the uh, assessment. Uh, and I'll do. I may be able to scroll up. I have to scroll. I might be able to scroll away at the top. Uh, oops, sorry. Uh, here it is. All right. There we go. So that one there. It's just um, that's just information uh, about the. Uh, oh, okay. The first bit was a link to the these slides. Don't worry about that. Um, the bit after where it says after 6 p.m. 16 p.m. Um, it's just to do with agency. There'll be a five mark question at agency. The, the test is out of 40 marks, so it's there. Essentially, everything's a half a percent of your overall grade, um, and so the um, uh, that's just some reading to help you answer the question on agency, because you need to be able to explain um, uh, what an well, we have to explain what an agent is and how they can ratify a decision. So if an agent goes and does something um, without telling the principal, and they've gone and made a profit, if they've gone and made a profit, you can turn around and say, ah. Oh, you, my agent, were actually working for me. I'm going to ratify that decision um, as part of that, assuming that the third party thinks that it's um, it's me. I'm a disclosed principal. I can say, hey, that money that you made selling my stuff um, on the side, that secret profit you made, I would like that. I'm ratifying that decision. I'm deciding at law to put myself in your shoes, so I would just like my money, the money that you made from that. You're allowed to do that. That is the process of ratification. Um, I think that's at 8.1.810 in the in LibGuide. So you will have to do that probably to answer that question. It's five marks. Um, you'll probably have to use that database to go and have a little read about that. Um, so the other thing to note, you have to know the rules for fixes and chattels. Each of the, um, there's four questions, or four parts I should say. They've got a bunch of little small questions. Each of them is only worth one or two marks. Every time you explain a rule, you must have a source. In order to get full marks for a question, you must have a source. It's a case or a, a specific section or subsection where a rule comes from. Be precise with those if you can. Case, just the whole case is fine, but if it's a particular um, a subsection, you need to, to note that it's, um, you know, for, for example, it's not, but if we were talking about whether undue influence could form part of the rules in section 21, you'd use 22 sub 1 sub D, you'd need to put that whole bit in there as part of that to get full marks for question. If you haven't got it, or you've just explained it, eh, maybe not quite perfectly, you can still get part marks for questions. So I'm expecting that people are going to go through and get part marks for a variety of places. But note that for some answers as such, there are right and wrong. Um, as part of it. So again, it's not trick. There's definitely, definitely not trick questions as part of this. Um, but sometimes you are going to have to find the rule. The rule, most of them will come from the slides. The only one, it's a little weak, is agency, which is why you've got that database link there, which I've 
also put in the test itself. It'll be in there too. Um, and so that uh, there's that example. And again, uh, Yu Yang, I've mentioned I'm going to put Yu Yang in there because it's even though it's bizarre to understand, just know and understand that um, the result of that case. Um, and that's about it, I think. Fixes and chattels will be in there. Um, joint tenancy and tenancy in common. You have to explain each of those. What's going to happen? Um, and yeah, and I haven't put the tort something there. I haven't really decided on for tort. I'm not sure yet. Probably defamation. Um, but it'll be with all of those things. It's going to be going through the slides. So it'll have a short scenario. Probably somebody posting something nasty on Facebook, um, and you're going to have to use the um, use the rules that we talked about in class. Okay, I'm going to leave it there. I, don't, I think we're. Um, I think that's about it for um, uh, for the. For this, I don't think there's really much else I can add. Is that it's not trick questions? They're not trick questions, but it will take you a few hours. And look, it kind of is. Yeah, you know, sadly, it's a learning process as part of it. Um, it's you know a high, it's a high stress thing for a few hours. But to be honest, if you do it for a few hours in a high stress environment, you've largely finished it. Um, you've still got the rest of the weekend to go back and check stuff if you do want to go back and check it. Is it um, time? So is it time to no. make Say no, some, of the, like. some of it tomorrow. Like it'll it'll be open. Uh, it box won't appear until there. Real and personal. Yes, uh, you know there is stuff about fixtures and chattels in this one, and there is things about uh, um, joint tenancy and tenancy in common. I think that's in there and the different types of stuff. That's it. The only problem, guys, that I can't help you with, is because it's a it's really they're not trick questions, but I can't help you. So if you have a question, and you can email me. But if it's a question about the test, that if there's something confusing, I'll send it to the whole class. So make sure you check your inbox, you know, periodically throughout the um, weekend. If it's if something comes up late in the piece that's so problematic, um, again, we'll I'll push the the date back as well. But again, I'll have to send an announcement to the class. I don't think there will be. But um, if it's a question about something that you're not quite sure about, you're welcome to ask me. But I some things I won't. I will be able to answer things I won't. And if I do answer a student's question to clarify something, I'll post that to the whole class as well. Um, so just. 20%? Sorry? How much is worth this one? It's 20%. It's 20%. So it's not a huge piece. Uh, but it should say, I reckon it'll take a couple of hours uh, to go through and do, I would think. Um, it's not long. So the answers can be done not long. In fact, I think I've even said that for each of the first three parts, the entire part, 200 words, 200 words, 200 words maximum for each of those. The last question, question four, because the fixtures and chattels thing requires you to apply um, a bit more, I didn't want to put a, a, a tight restriction. So I've made that 400. I don't think you're going to need 400 words, um, but that's just, I didn't want people to stress about it. Um, that's all. So you, you can talk for as much like you, you can probably answer it in less, you know, sort of between two and 300, but it's it's maximum of 400. You're not going to get much advantage talking about it forever. Um, so don't think you've got to max that out. Um, that's really the, yeah, that's it. That's it really. It's, I said, there's no trick questions. If there is, if something looks like a trick question, just send me an email. I said, I'll check it multiple times. I'll be frantically marking a weekend. So I'll be, I'll be literally sitting right here. Okay. That gonna leave it there, guys. chance to check assessment two. I have to mark my first year. Um, so I've got to finish marking my first year ones before I can mark your guys' uh, ones, and I've got the environmental yeah. ones. I've got. I actually have all three of my subjects have uh, outstanding assessment right now. So I'm frantically doing. I'm, I'm, I said I'm tentatively aiming for Monday, but I'll see how I go. Um, but I'll, I'll see. If I have long eyes like this by the end of the weekend, you'll yeah, we'll see. See how we go. All right. Thanks, team. Hope that was useful. Um, Thank you, Simon. And I'll talk to you soon, eh? Ciao, ciao.